Good afternoon. I want to ask all of us to please turn our cell phones to silent. You may notice board members accessing their laptops, phones, or other devices during the meeting. They're using their devices to access board meeting material that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct board's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I'll ask that person to conduct him or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individual listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the uh, teleconference process. For those members of the public participa participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment uh, period, please press star one. You will hear a tone indicating you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press star two. Assistance is available throughout the teleconference meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. During agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited public comment period for individuals and the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, public comment from the individuals here at the meeting will also be limited to 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on the teleconference line and those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Business Services Office staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. The board welcomes public comments on any item on the agenda and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to board taking an action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on the agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or come forward and you will be recognized. I would like to request all speakers to complete a presenter slips so I can call on you by name at the appropriate time and that the record of this meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give your slip to Ms. Cruz Jones. Ms. Cruz, <clears throat> I'll uh, do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make last minute comment. I want to remind all speakers to please stay on the topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Today's meeting will be run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law. We plan to end the meeting around 6.30 p.m. I would like to call the meeting to the order and ask Ms. Cruz Jones to call roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Present. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Krause? Present. Ms. Lawson? Here. Dr. Levine? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Pines? Here. Ms. Sutton-Wills? Here. Mr. Warmoth? Here. Ms. Wright? Dr. Yip? Here. Dr. Gonadev? Here. Thank you. Quorum is uh, present. I would like to remind members again that we'll be taking a roll call on all action items. Moving forward to public com agenda item two, which is public comments not on the agenda. We have slips. Before we hear from our first speaker, I would like to ask individuals making public comments that you not discuss pending compliance, pending applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are con uh, considered ex parte communi communications as they could provide information to the members that's outside of the record. 
such discussions could create a conflict and lead to board decision being challenged in superior court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's process in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. In addition, the board would like to, the public to address the board as a whole and direct comments to the board. I have the following slips. Uh, Ms. Montserrat Ramos. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Montserrat Ramos. And after the discussion that took place at the last board meeting with Dr. Krause's comments and concerns about public comment on the teleconference line, I felt compelled to voice my support for the teleconference line. As I mentioned to all of you at a meeting in San Diego this last year, we spent a lot of time critiquing your actions here. At that time and at this moment, I want to acknowledge the positive action you have taken on behalf of consumers. One such action is the development of this teleconference line. I approached you back in 2010, requesting that you increase public participation and develop a teleconference line after a long personal history of not being able to communicate with this board unless I traveled across the state to your meetings. Along with Consumers Union, we lobbied executive staff and this board for this action. You were the first medical board that I know of to implement a teleconference line, and that is an accomplishment. I realize that you may have some concerns on how the teleconference line is being used, but I hope you realize that consumers are coming from a place of heartbreak. It isn't easy for consumers to approach this board and voice their concerns about the lack of accountability when it comes to the deaths of Californians and the lack of physician discipline in relation to those deaths. It is part of your job. It isn't easy for you to listen to it, I'm sure, as it isn't easy for us to keep coming here to try to lobby you to ensure that patient protection is truly a mission. Consumers aren't the only Californians who use this line. The medical associations use this line. Doctors, California Medical Association, and many, other use this, many others use this line to communicate with you. You are giving many stakeholders an opportunity to participate in these meetings, and I thank you for that. It's important. I can't stress how important it is, and the teleconference line is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We are not planning to eliminate teleconference line. We do want some rules. We'll come up with that, but right now, no, no, no elimination of the line. Mr. Andrist. Hello, everyone. I wanted to finally introduce you to my sister that was killed by a doctor and that you all refused to investigate the doctor that killed her. This is my sister, Callie Andrus. She was mentally disabled. Out of respect for the public who take out time out of their lives, often costing them money to take off work and, and get here to bring you information, I'd like you all to close your computers and put down your phones and pay attention until each of the comment sections are done. You can reopen them when your fellow board members speak. We don't buy that you need to be looking things up as we speak. It's just rude and unprofessional despite your disclaimer, doctor. First, is there a still an order for the passive censorship instruction to your cameraman to take the camera off of the board's faces during public comment? Are all of the board members aware of this passive censorship order? By a show of hands, how many approve of this passive censorship at the public meeting? None of you. Second, I want to thank Carmen Balber and Connor Finney of Consumer Watchdog for coming here today and putting together a press conference, and most especially, Spearheading the Patient's Bill of Rights Project. I support this 100% and want to remind you that anything other than 100% support from this board can never be interpreted as being in the name of patient safety. It is your duty to support this because these things should be happening anyway. All of the items in the Bill of Rights are common sense solutions to many of the ongoing problems with the board. 
Question, if all doctors are state mandated reporters, why are the doctors on this board not reporting cases of child sexual assault to the police when they see it in a complaint? Question, is there some reason that all of the staff documents on the internet are in a searchable format, but none of the disciplinary documents are? Are you purposely making it so that Google can't find the log and log disciplinary documents in order to make it harder for the public and better for doctors being disciplined? Show of hands, how many of you are aware that the medical board does this? How many approve of them doing this? Sorry, I'm nervous doing this first time in person. Finally, in the board member manual part one on page five, it says, if during a board me meeting a person wishes to address the board concerning alleged errors of procedure or protocol or staff misconduct involving matters that are currently under the, or subject to investigation or involve a pending administrative or a criminal action, the board will address the matters as follows. Where the allegation involves errors of procedure or protocol, the board may designate either its executive director or a board employee to review whether the procedure or protocol was followed and report back to the board. I would like the staff, I would like to address errors of procedure in that staff attorney Carrie Webb readily breaks the Public Records Act law. I CC'd all, all of you on this the other day, but I believe now that Carrie might have written a response to one of my public record requests and given it to public affairs analyst Alexandria Shimbra to send out as though she wrote it herself. It's clear that Alexandria didn't write it, and even if she did, it contains lawyer-type language Please that, conclude. that can be construed as practice of law. Unless she's a licensed lawyer in the state of California, I think that's illegal. Per that section in the board manual, I'm asking for this board to take the entire matter up for investigation and report back at the next meeting. I'd like for someone to make a motion to have that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Next one is Carmen ba Balbert, I think. Carmen, did I say the name right? Yes. Okay, thank you. It's Carmen Balber. I'm the executive director of Consumer Watchdog. Um, we are here to urge the board today to change course uh, and endorse a patient bill of rights to ensure notice, transparency, and accountability for patients in cases of physician discipline. Uh, we're in a system today uh, where patients are killed and no action is taken. And even when the board does take action in disciplinary cases, patients don't know about that action. Uh, I think the Me Too and the Time's Up movements have shown a light on sexual assault from Hollywood to the legislature, yet the doctor's office is still the last place where sexual assault is behind a veil of secrecy. And it's indicative of the problems fa patients face, learning about all kinds of patient harm from sexual assault to substance abuse, to a patient death caused by a doubt, <clears throat> and the medical board's actions to address those issues. So we have joined all of these patients here today uh, and advocacy organizations across the state to develop a patient bill of rights that would give patients the following rights in the medical board enforcement process because this is all about patients have knowledge and information so future patients are protected from harm in the board's enforcement process. The Bill of Rights includes the right to notice and participation, such as the right to be interviewed when you submit a complaint to the medical board. You cannot have all the facts if you don't speak before you choose to close a case. The right to transparency, such as the right to disclosure if a doctor is on probation. Right now, doctors can be uh, placed on probation for sexually assaulting patients yet his future female patients will never know why there's another lady in the room. It's a travesty and you should, uh, it includes the right to timely action. You know as well as everyone uh, that four years to reach the end of a, an investigation involving a patient, patient death or other serious harm needs to speed up. And we urge you to support a stronger vertical enforcement process so the whole proceedings can be streamlined because four years while more patients are placed in harm's way is simply unacceptable. The Patient Bill of Rights would also include a right to prop uh, proportionate, pardon me, enforcement. 
because it is inconceivable to the public that somehow the board would not even follow its own disciplinary guidelines. And in the case of a death of a patient where you found something was actually wrong, all a doctor gets is a public letter of reprimand. And then patients are never even told about that public letter. So we urge you to support making your disciplinary guidelines mandatory. Uh, and we urge you to investigate every patient complaint that comes before the board that involves a patient death. And finally, uh, the right to accountability. Um, we believe that the enforcement process could use an outside look, a 10,000 foot view. Uh, so we're urging you to support a state auditor audit of the medical board's enforcement process and a right to independent arbiters. We've seen too many times concerns that personal connections uh, Ballard, between- please conclude. Absolutely, personal con connections between physicians who are making the decisions about physician disciplinary action cause questions of whether there was fairness. So the final piece is a right to independent arbiters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barber. Uh, next one is Tracy Watts. Good afternoon, my name is Dr. Tracy E. Watts, and- um, Let's pull the microphone up. Sorry. Sure. Make sure it's on. Sorry, first time, haven't done this previously. Um, thank you very much for allowing us to speak today. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come and voice our concerns. I am here uh, to speak to the absolute intolerable lack of transparency for physician misconduct in the state of California. Um, my own case is a complicated one, so I won't go through a lot of the detail here, but um, in, in short, I was tortured, injured, and I fervently believed, based on the injuries that I sustained, sexually assaulted in a hospital during a medical procedure in 2016. Um, and I am here to voice support, obviously, uh, for, for the bill that's being considered, um, SB 4, uh, 1448, um, which is an urgently needed step forward <coughs> towards transparencies for, for doctors um, and accountability um, for their patients. With regard to uh, my own case, um, transparency is in very short supply. Uh, in fact, although I filed a complaint with the Medical Board of California, I was one of those, in fact, who was never interviewed about what had occurred. And I have recently found um, substantial documentary evidence, for example, that my physicians have, um, I, I believe, uh, in due course, illegally tampered with my medical records, including deleting medical record information um, in violation of federal HIPAA regulations. Um, I, have, um, I have here, in point of fact, sustained um, allegations from the department, the California Department of Public Health with regard to these missing medical records um, and the investigation there is ongoing um, because we have found some additional instances of this. Um, my, my concern here is that this, this information was available and the Medical Board of California did nothing about this. The people who had access to my medical records were physicians. Um, and so I'm, I'm having a very difficult time with how some of these agencies can find, can find uh, evidence of, of problems, um, but not others. Uh, again, I was not interviewed, um, so the information that they had was probably admittedly very limited. Um, so I, that's something that I, I would definitely um, urge, urge you to take into consideration. Um, reform is just desperately needed in California. Um, these facilities are very clearly um, protecting commerce over patients' lives. I urge um, also anyone, I am a representative of uh, the uh, patient advocacy group, uclapatientcare.com, um, that's where this occurred, to, uh, to contact that particular agency if they have been harmed at UCLA or if they have experienced, as so many people that I have personally spoken with, medical records misconduct at this facility. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Next one is uh, Marianne Hollingsworth, Ms. Hollingsworth. Good afternoon, my name is Marianne Hollingsworth and I am with the Patient Safety Action Network and the Medical Board Roundtable. I would like to ask you to put an agenda item on the next meeting dealing with the National Practitioner Data Bank. As you know, this data bank was set up as a repository for records of doctors who have had disciplines or malpractice awards in all 50 states. When it was established in 1990, it was decided that only medical boards and hospitals could have access to this information. The public cannot. Some of you may have had this little packet 
with all these lists that I, that I brought. Uh, these are randomly chosen California doctors off the data bank. Uh, you'll notice that all these doctors have multiple entries for malpractice and adverse actions. One had 19 entries in just 11 years. Now you may be interested to know that there are at least five California doctors in the data bank, not necessarily the ones on this list, um, who have multiple entries, yet their records on the medical board website are completely clear. Uh, I don't know the names of these doctors because I don't have access to this information, um, the same access that you do, uh, but you may want to look that up to see who these doctors are and maybe rectify that. Recently, the M Milwaukee Sentinel and the MedPage Today came out with a report about how medical boards across the country use the National Practitioner Data Bank. Some use it often, and some apparently don't use it at all. As you know, the information can be invaluable for sorting out doctors who are fleeing disciplines in another state and want to practice here. Please consider a regular report on how the medical board uses the National Practitioner Data Bank once or twice a year would be great. It would be helpful to know how California ranks in this data bank and how often the board accesses it for information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hollingsford. Next one is Carrie H. My name is Carrie H. I was sexually assaulted by a doctor, Michael Popkin, during my visit. I contacted the medical board after the incident and was told at least two other women had filed complaints against him, but no action was taken. Why not? If the board had taken action and revoked his license and placed him on probation, I might not be a victim. I was told by the medical board staff they didn't have enough staff, resources, or to adequately follow through with any complaint, and they weren't sure what, if anything, would ever happen to him. I felt I had been a victim. I felt myself victimized again by the medical board because you took lack of action. Working with the Sex Crimes Unit in Los Angeles Police Department, I decided to persist participate in a news conference to ra raise awareness about sexual assault by doctors. Since my news conference in December of 17, many other victims did come forward and um, found that he had been sexually assaulting women since the 1980s. I'm here today because I want to prevent others from becoming victims and I want victims to know that it's okay for them to come forward and call the police. The best way to prevent another patient from becoming a sexual assault victim is to file a complaint with their law, local law enforcement officials and then the medical board. I urge the medical board and local law enforcement to take action as soon as sexual assault claims against doctors are filed. And I urge the medical board and members of this committee to require that doctors who are on probation be required to notify their patients. Doctors throughout the state are currently on probation for sexually assaulting patients. They're already eroded the trust of, the, of their victims. Patients need this information so they can make an informed decision. If I would have had the information about what you hit on the shelves of all the notifications from the other ladies who had, he had sexually assaulted, I would have ch not chose him. However, I was able to work hard with the Attorney General, my um, district, did the district attorney, my detective, who was absolutely wonderful, De Detective Marino, and we found so many women, and it just broke my heart and everyone else's because of because of his lack of ability. Please conclude. He had um, has been 
I hear you. Um, convicted. And will be. Um, and has lost his license. He will be known as a sex offender. He should have had this done to him many years ago. So really think about the people that you're not protecting. I understand some of your things, thoughts on wanting to protect some of the doctors, but really please think of the people of the state of California. It's hell going through these things. This should never happen. Thank you. My name is Lisa Mackey, and I'm a victim's advocate, and I've been working with Carrie, but I just wanted to um, point out something that I think is very important with respect to sexual assault and battery victims and doctors. How many times have you um, had your daughter or your son you know, or your husband or your wife go into a doctor's office alone with that doctor? I was um, raped by my pediatrician uh, when I was a little girl, as was my sister. And we were in a room alone with the doctor, so that happened. Um, it's super important that something be done to protect against that kind of abuse, um, that there is more transparency, that you agree to, to enact and accept the Victim's Bill of Rights. Many people don't come forward. In my case, I didn't know anything was wrong, sadly. I told no one. Um, and so it's just so important, and I know that you can do the right thing and understand that there's, um, it's not even medical malpractice, it's, it's a crime. So I hope you protect all of our people in the state of California. Thank you. Thank you both. Carrie, we, our hearts are with you. We, I understand what you're going through. I, if there is anything my staff can do, please connect with them. Uh, they, there is absolutely no excuse for any doctor or any person to commit to well. sexual harassment. To you. Yeah, thank you. Love to do that. We can set up a time if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Tammy Smick. And Tim Smick. And Tim Smick. Good to see both of you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Tammy Smick. I'm here with my husband, Tim Smick. Uh, we testified at the last medical board meeting in San Jose, um, where we shared our contempt at the board's handling of our complaint um, and our disapproval of the board's lenient uh, discipline in the case of Dr. Daniel J. Hedrick. And just to briefly remind you, I, I see a couple of members who weren't here last time. Um, our son, Alex, sought treatment for Dr. Hedrick to safely detox off of prescription pain medications. His first night under Dr. Hedrick's care, Alex was given 11 different medications. And then because Dr. Hedrick wrote an order to check Alex's vitals only while awake, he was left unmonitored for more than seven hours. Alex was found dead during morning rounds. He was already in rigor mortis. After filing an accusation against Dr. Hedrick for repeated acts of negligence resulting in Alex's death, this board allowed Dr. Hedrick to bargain his discipline down to a public reprimand. And for that, we waited four long years. During the meeting and after some of you kindly approached us and spoke with us, you shared your words of sympathy for our loss, and we do appreciate that. Um, but there was really no explanation um, as to the mishandling of our complaint other than bureaucracy, red tape, and your hands were tied. So we're here to support um, this patient bill of rights so that other complainants don't have to endure the same painful process that my husband and I had to suffer through. This Bill of Rights would provide timely action in the enforcement process and provide proportionate penalties so that public reprimands could not be used in cases involving patient death. Um, we urge you to endorse the vital provisions in this bill 
including providing timely action, transparency, and ensuring that appropriate discipline is taken, especially in high priority cases involving death. Thank you for your time. Mr. Smith. Yes, I also <clears throat> want to say that you know the red tape you have to go through and the procedures, and I get all that. It's, it's a game for an attorney to see how long they could take you guys to get your job done. I, we realize that, and you know that as well. So we're just asking that you go along with this and try these. It's different, something different, because what you're doing isn't working. So let's try something different to get these policies changed, and I'm just urging you to go with it and vote for it. Thank you both. I have no other slips. Anybody else in the audience wants to make a public comment? Any comments on the phone? Yes, we do have one comment from the phone line. Go ahead, please. Thank you. It will come from Susan Lauren. Your line is now open, Susan. Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to come in person today, but a surgeon disabled me in 2011, so I wasn't able to. I do live in L.A., you may recall from my previous phone calls that I was petite with breasts large enough to cause me pain, so my physician highly recommended a board-certified plastic surgeon for breast reduction. The surgeon, who bragged about his credentials, experience, and artistry, convinced me he had to do a touch of lipo on my upper lateral thigh or I'd look imbalanced and end up right back on the operating table, which would take me away from my businesses again, he said. I objected, told him I was risk adverse, loved my hourglass shape and strong muscles, but had some skin ptosis. I told him I didn't want any scar tissue that wasn't medically necessary. I asked if fat cells grow larger in untreated areas because I was as fit as could be. He told me that after surgery, I'd see that all my concerns were totally overblown. This was fraud. While I was under anesthesia at his private surgery center, he operated egregiously and destroyed my human vessel. He cut me dozens of times over 60% of my body, 60% of my body, removed my gluteus, infragluteal crease, parts of my hamstrings, lower legs, waist, etc., against my wishes or any rationale. He left me with skin adherent to my bones and botched my breast. He followed this gross negligence and incompetence with a smear campaign and a criminal cover-up. In court, he poured bottles of water into a bowl that appeared like a magician and said he only took a few liters, but in consultation, he told me the amount was tiny, no big deal, and just to smooth a small contour. I was contraindicated for liposuction. His notes are inept and fabricated, and when I spoke about the tragic outcome, he wrote to my doctor and Social Security and said that my words were fictitious. This is libel. The medical board investigator told me she could see I was mutilated. Anyone can. But your board dismissed the claim. Ten doctors who examined me said, this is gross negligence, incompetence, and battery. He butchered you, made you an invalid. It's the worst thing I've ever seen. This is way below standard. He violated you. This is insane, etc. A reality show surgeon with scathing, absolutely scathing reviews, misled a jury, riding on the endorsement of the fact that he reviews cases for your board. He said my missing parts are due to natural causes when, in fact, the offending surgeon removed deep myofascial tissue with a power tool that I didn't even know about. It's not in the interest of public safety, first of all, to have that man working for you. I've asked to reopen this case. Thus far, your board has failed to uphold your statutory duty to protect citizens. If your experts decide it's okay for a board-certified plastic surgeon in California to mutilate a woman alive, oh, maybe because she's not 20 years old or for any other reason, then you need new experts. And I would really like to thank all of these wonderful people, um, experts, uh, activists who have just spoken. Thank you all so much. I want to thank Alex from Senator Jerry Hill's office for his support. I hope Christina Delp and others at your board are going to do the right thing to protect patients from uh, plastic surgeons taking surgical carte blanche causing Please severe conclude. bodily harm. I was actually mutilated alive, and you guys have done nothing. I mean, this is so... It's just not acceptable. Talk about patient bill of rights. Now, lots of women in California. Ms. Lauren, have, please I conclude. I started a, a group. I'm an activist myself, and they are threatened by their doctors, and they can't get lawyers, and they can't even function to get to 
to do a complaint to you guys. I speak for a lot of people, and these women, these people in the room know that I speak for a lot of people. And the, my case is so egregious, something just absolutely has to be done. Because I'm, I am, I am, I'm sitting, which I don't do a lot during the day, but I'm sitting without a buttocks. It's Miss Lauren, I'm please not conclude. Nervous to speak, but my voice. Please conclude. You're way every past your three minutes. Second. It's not right. I lost my life. Now do the right thing and get this doctor out of practice. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Lauren. Any other? Anybody else on the phone? No further comments from the phones. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, let's move on to our next agenda item, approval of minutes from January 18, 19, 2018 board meeting. Are there any additions, corrections to the meeting minutes? Uh, so moved to approve them. Okay. Second. Do we have a second? Okay. Uh, public comment uh, from the audience. Uh, Eric Andrus, Mr. Andrus. First of all, it's very sad. There weren't that many speakers to interrupt people when they're passionate about these stories. Carrie, that's just, I know you're told to do that, but, but there weren't that many people speaking. You've given a, a 20 minutes of speaking to people. If we haven't taken up the whole 20 minutes, let the woman speak. She's telling you guys something really, really important that your board is failing. And Carrie's job is to tell her to shut up. I just think that's terrible. At the last meeting, I brought up that there were things I said that were not included in the minutes. While it seems that everything the board says is included, it happened again this time. At the last meeting, Howard Krauss was agreed that the board and staff were being harassed and harangued and called for the Attorney General's office to weigh in on the matter. I see that his comment was included. As I brought up this, now I've lost my place. I see that his comment was included, but not surprisingly, my comment following his was not included. As I brought up that citizens have free speech right to speak on topics at the meeting, why wouldn't you want that comment in the minutes? Because it proves your own board member wrong? It seems that whomever is taking the minutes and compiling them is selectively picking and choosing what appears in the end product. Does that fall under Ronald Lewis's job as secretary? Is he responsible for the censored omissions? Even if you're not required to include everything everyone says, you put in enough of what every board member says to set a precedent. The public's words should likewise be included. We aren't paid to come here. In fact, most of us lose money to fly to these destinations. It costs $34 to park here today. And if we come twice, that's $68 just to park to come to this meeting. I'd like to officially ask the board to take this matter up as is allowed in the board manual part one on page five, and I'd like someone to make a motion to do so. Maybe one of our less heard public members who rarely ever speak can, can bring up that motion so that you work on the fact that your minutes are incomplete and then you're approving them even though we tell you that they're incomplete. Something's wrong here, folks. Thank you, Mr. Andrist. Any other comments? Any comments on the phone? No comments on the phone. Okay, any other comments from the board? Otherwise, Ms. Cruz Jones, roll call, please. Dr. Bola? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Aye. Ms. Lawson? Abstain due to my absence at that meeting. Dr. Levine? Abstain. <coughs> Excuse me, abstain. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Abstain. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. The motion carries. I uh, will go to agenda item four President's report. Ms. Pines and I had calls with the executive staff to discuss the meeting agenda and other board projects. We had frequent calls due to the issues going uh, on at this time of the year. In addition, Ms. Pines and I are pleased to inform you that the strategic plan has been completed. Each of you should have received on the table a copy of the finalized plan. 
Along with this plan is the release of the board's new logo. As those of you heard today, the board is going to be doing a lot of innovative things for the both consumers and the licensees to provide education, which is covered in the board strategic plan. In regards to the board's committees, no changes have been made, but I would like to let everyone know that with the completion of tomorrow's action from marijuana task force, this task force will be disbanded. Since this task force has provided us with the guidelines that have been approved, there is no further action to be taken that will necessitate task force meetings. Issues pertaining to can uh, cannabis will be brought to the full board or other standing committee if necessary. Next week, the board will be attending the, its third annual legislative day. We have several meetings set up with the legislators to educate them on the functions of the board and the board's role. We'll be going in teams of two to visit with members. We look forward to a great day where we can educate the members on the board and its mission. Are there any questions from the board? Okay. Comments uh, from the audience? Mr. Andrist. So I'm confused, first of all, on the procedure from your manual that says that we can ask for the executives to call for these things. Nobody's doing that. Is there some reason for that? Just make your comment, sir. Well, no, I have a question. If that's the end of your comment, then you're When did I say it was the end of the comment? I had a question. See, now you're, avo now you're avoiding it. Your <clears throat> now you're avoiding it. It's interesting that the president's comments only deal with notable accomplishments and priorities, and never with any of the problems that the medical board suffers, like your 4% disciplinary rate or the fact that you have 15,000 public documents missing from Breeze. How many of you didn't know you had 15,000 public documents missing from Breeze? Did you, are you all aware of that? This, this, this Breeze website that you tell people they should go look at to find out about doctors where there's 15,000 documents missing? Maybe this is why nothing ever changes here at the board. The medical board has been under fire for over a century for not doing its job properly, and maybe that's due in part to you all sticking your head in the sand and patting each other on the back instead of getting in the trenches and actively working to make this board the best it can be, like we're asking you to do on the Patient Bill of Rights. You praise Kimberly Kirkmeyer every year for the wonderful job she's doing, but she actually ignores most of my correspondence to her and never seems to actively work on solving any of the problems that the board faces. She sits back and allows her own staff secretary to break the Public Records Act law, which alone should be enough to call both of their jobs into question. Why aren't any of you concerned that you're not following the Public Records Act to the letter. Why aren't you concerned about this? It's in the law. It's our right as the public to be able to ask the, the medical board for public documents and to follow the laws to the T and Kerry only just gives out general exemptions that are not even mandatory. She exempts every single document automatically, but that's not how the law works and you all just sit back and let it happen. But that's never in the president's message. Why is that, Dev? It's Mark. Thank you, Mr. Andrist. Oh, we have another one. Dr. Yafai. Great pronunciation. Dr. Dev, I'm sorry. I was just a little bit confused about you just mentioned cannabis is no longer going to be. The task force is now is going to be disbanded, but any issues will be taken up by a committee at the full board. The medical full board or the um, adult use active, or the adult cannabis group? This board. This board, okay. Any other comments from people here? Comments on the phone? No comments on the phone. Thank you. Moving to agenda item five, communications with the interested parties. Do members have any, anything to report? Okay. 
I, as, you, as usual, my comment is that I meet with multiple stakeholders along with the staff, legislature, governor's office, CMA, and whoever else wants to meet with me in time somewhere where I can make it. So, uh, uh, and I can tell you that unless it's a board issue, we will not talk about board issues and every board issue I talk about to the legislature, my staff is fully aware of. Any comments from the audience here? Comments on the phone? We have no comments on the phone. Yeah, the next one is uh, discussion and possible action of appointment of a member to the health Profession, uh, Health Professions Education Foundation and term limits of the appointment. Ms. Kirschmeyer. Well, good afternoon. Um, at the last meeting, we actually had appointed um, two members to the Health Professions Education Foundation. Unfortunately, one of those individuals is not gonna be able to serve on that foundation, so we do need another member with that, and I've reached out to members for those that um, show interest, and um, Dr. Hawkins um, has actually come forward to be on that um, foundation. So with that, I'd like to ask for a motion um, to put Dr. Hawkins on the Health Professions Education as a representative for the Medical Board. So moved. Okay. Any, any comments from the board? Comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Levine? Excuse me, Dr. Levine. <laughs> Ms. Lawson? <laughs> Ms. Pines? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, guys, we need to have a little more energy here. Uh, I'll give it to Kim for one more. And then the second thing that we found out in talking to the Health Professions Education Foundation Executive Director is that we had set them for two-year term limits. I'd actually like to move those to four-year term limits or until the expiration of the board member um, because it'll stand more in line with their term limits for their members. So I'd like to have a motion to change the term limits as well from two to four or until the board member's term ends on the medical board. We have a second. Okay, any comments from the board? Comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Dr. Levine? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Dr. Gonadev. Aye. See, the energy came back so quickly. Uh, let's move to the uh, next item, agenda item seven, possible action on 2019 board meeting dates. Ms. Kirschmeyer. Um, I'd like to draw the members' attention to the board meeting dates for 2019 that are find under, found under agenda item seven. As you may notice, we are making the board meetings later in each quarter. We are doing this to assist with obtaining statistics for the board meeting cycles, um, as well as trying to assist when the board reveals bills in this legislative cycle to give Ms. Samoes more time with her term. So when the bills come forward, we have a little bit more time to bring those to the board. In addition, you may notice that rather than identify a specific city, we are identifying a region. This will assist in finding a location for the meeting rather than have to come back to the board and vote on a meeting location change. With the needed time between board meetings, we have identified the dates that are in the document. The only date that has two options is the November meeting. Um, that's November 14th and 15th actually seemed to have a lot of activity, so I had to remove that one. So we're offering either November 7th and 8th, with I, which I know may not work for all members, or November 21st and 22nd, which is actually the week before Thanksgiving. Um, it's not the week of Thanksgiving, so that's a good thing. Um, but the week before, and most people usually travel the week of, not the week before, so you guys can make that determination. So with that, um, if there's, unless there's any other recommendations, you can have discussion on the November date, and if the other dates are okay, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve them. 
Point of information. Um, yeah, Dr. Krause. Perhaps my calendar, oh, never mind. I was looking at the wrong year. I did the same. <coughs> All right, Howard, you're excused for Thank this you. one. Uh, any, any other comments on the November dates? Uh, Ms. Lawson. So, yeah, the only ones I feel strongly about are the November dates um, and that we not have it be the 21st and 22nd. Um, a lot of schools take off um, not only the week of Thanksgiving, but they do things the week before, and I think that we're going to lose members of the public as well if we have it that close to the holiday. So your recommendation to use number 7, 8, is that what, uh, Christina? Yes, exactly. Okay. Any comments on that? Yeah. And I just want you to know that uh, Northern California, it says Sacramento, San Jose, because it has, get, it has been getting so difficult to get a hotel to stay in Sacramento for the what state of California pays. So that's why San Jose is being considered. Is that right, Kim? Yeah, and it's really Northern California. I'm not saying it might be San Jose, but it'll be Northern California. And those are just the two that usually we're looking at, but um, it could be in that area. Milpitas, we did last time, but. Comments? Yes. Just as we're thinking about um, locations, LAX, not for everybody, just in case. Oh, as we're looking at locations, we can consider alternatives to LAX area, I know there's board member that lives 15 minutes away, but some of us who have to drive, it's uh, very difficult to get out of here on Friday night as you live here. So that's why I was looking at uh, um, San Diego, uh, Anaheim and Orange have reached out to us um, for deals for their hotels. So if staff and executive director could just consider it, that would be great, thank you. Dr. Ganonet, can I make one other point on that? I know that the Central Valley is difficult for all of us to get to, but it would be uh, worth it for us to consider having a meeting, um, you know, either uh, truly out um, in the Central Valley, either in Fresno or in Bakersfield, uh, and also even going out to the Inland Empire, or Riverside, uh, San Bernardino. Yeah, the, the Ontario uh, includes Riverside, San Bernardino area. so. Uh, so I think uh, LAX pain, I know I can feel the same pain tomorrow driving back home. Uh, it takes four hours to normally, which takes only an hour and a half. Uh, but uh, uh, Ms. Karshmeyer, uh, uh, Denise Pines and I will seriously look at locations. Thank you. Okay, can we have a motion to approve the change being the November 7 to 8 and all the other considerations, what to include in those areas? Second. Okay, any comments from the board? Comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? None from the phone. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Aye. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. And the motion carries. Okay. She's here, right? Yeah, she's here. Okay. Yeah, we're just checking to make sure the speaker was here. Uh, moving to next item, which is uh, item number eight, presentation on Stanford Late Career Practitioner Policy. I would like to ask Dr. Venaker to come forward. Dr. Venaker. She is Senior Vice Chair of Medicine for Clinical Operations at Stanford University and is Associate Chief Medical Officer, Patient Care Services at Stanford Healthcare. She is also the interim Chief Quality Officer at Stanford Healthcare. She is currently a Professor of Medicine, Divis Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, and is Associate Director of the Intensive Care Unit. Dr. Venaker was appointed in November 2009 to be one of our four leaders designated to actively, one of the four leaders designated to actively design, guide, and implement strategies to improve the patient experience 
at Stanford, and she continues to serve in this capacity. Dr. Renneker. Jennifer, go ahead and move use over. The, use the other one. Sorry. I don't know. Let me try this one. This one's green. All right. So thank you for um, for allowing me to come talk about this, uh, which I, I think is a very important subject and a difficult one actually to uh, to deal with. So let me just give you a little bit of background to start with. Um, as you, I know, are aware, it's the responsibility of medical staffs to be sure that we um, protect the quality of patient care um, and we also ensure the competence of physicians. Focusing on uh, the group that we're here to talk about today, or that I'm here to talk about today, um, physicians who are late in their career, the number of physicians uh, that are 65 years old or older uh, in this country has more than quadrupled uh, between 1975 and 2013. And although this slide says 20% of the physicians in the U.S. are older than 65, it's somewhere between 20 and 25 probably percent of us are older than 65. So a, a big uh, proportion of the workforce. As I think everyone is aware, age-related declines in cognitive and physical functioning um, can affect professional performance. And unfortunately, we as physicians are not immune to that. Uh, to the ravages, uh, potential ravages of age. There are some studies of older physicians who have been referred to medical boards or to regulatory bodies uh, that, uh, because of poor practice, uh, that about half of them have cognitive difficulties. And a number of studies have shown that older physicians are more prone to cognitive impairment. Uh, some studies have shown substance abuse, although obviously uh, that's not an issue that is, re uh, that is relegated to older practitioners. Um, and physiologic decline. Uh, there are a number of uh, things that can affect each age, and the reason that we look at older practitioners and think that we need to screen them in a slightly different way is the same reason that you look at uh, people when they reach a certain age to screen for breast cancer or prostate cancer or to start looking for other conditions that occur as we get older. So um, we, we do need to be aware that, uh, that this is an issue. But age by itself isn't a reason uh, to, to say that a person has cognitive decline. I'm sure you all know people who are well advanced in age who are um, just as bright and sharp as they've ever been. So age by itself uh, does not always uh, or even necessarily result in a decline in cognitive functioning. And age and experience can really increase important aspects of physicians' practice, um, particularly uh, in areas of knowledge. When physicians get older, the things that we forget are not the things that we've known forever. The things that we are more likely to forget are the things that we just learned. And so that's where there's a bit of a challenge sometimes for some people. Um, we also, as we get older and have seen more and have seen more patients and have taken care of more people and interacted with more other human beings, hopefully develop a lot more compassion. And then we also learn to deal with stress in a way that um, sometimes younger practitioners can't. And so there are some real benefits to being older. There are some disadvantages, and if we want to talk just about the cognitive um, aspects of it, Physicians who are older um, are more likely to be able to react better uh, when there is an emergency that they need to deal with that is similar to other emergencies that they've always dealt with before or that, that are uh, in a way familiar. Where we are challenged as we get older as human beings is to, is to develop new ways to deal with new problems. And so we may be much, much, much better than the younger practitioners at dealing with things that we've seen a lot of times before. And in fact, we've seen a lot of things they haven't seen. When it comes to new uh, situations and new knowledge, that's where there can be a challenge as we get older. And I, I want to emphasize again and again, it's not always true. One of my colleagues who is 
69 just took the, uh, retook the, uh, 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 one of the board examinations that we have to take every 10 years. Um, and he was in the top 1%. So just let me, I can't emphasize that enough, that it's not every aging person or every aging physician. And we've also all known people who were younger um, who developed cognitive uh, impairment. We've known people with Alzheimer's and other problems who weren't even 60 yet. So when we think about all of these things, um, if we're going to think about developing a policy to deal with uh, aging practitioners, there are a couple of things that we have to keep in mind. One is that we really have to put patient care first. It's very difficult for physicians, for anybody, but for, for physicians for whom our jobs aren't just our jobs. For many of us, it's who we are. It's how we define ourselves. Um, it's our life. And we put a, other aspects of our lives on hold. So when we bring this up, uh, and when I have brought this up to my colleagues, uh, one of the first things they say is, you know, I've been doing this a long time. You can't do this to me. This is age discrimination. And it's really not about us first. It's about patients first. But having said that, any policy uh, that is ever developed and the policy that we have at Stanford, um, we very much kept in mind that we need to protect the reputation and the self-esteem of the physicians. When we're talking about older physicians, particularly in academic medical centers like Stanford and others, uh, a lot of the people who are uh, now very late in their careers have made amazing contributions to medicine. They've discovered antibodies and they've discovered treatments for cancer and they've discovered new diseases and it's just, so we have to keep in mind that, that the people that we're talking about are incredibly bright people who have done really wonderful things and we have to protect their reputations and their self-esteem. But it's also pretty devastating to see someone who has accomplished this much who then is uh, impaired and no longer really able to function in the same way and people start shoving him or her in a different direction and keeping them away from things or protecting them uh, when they see that they've just said or done something that's not right. I thought there was another thing. Oh, so um, there is a, a growing support for the development of late career practitioner policies or policies similar to th that will in some way look at, uh, look at us as we get older. Um, since we adopted our policy in, uh, initially in 2012, put it on hiatus for a while and then really put it into uh, full swing in 2013, a number of other places have um, also developed policies and I've consulted with a lot of people who were in the process of uh, trying to decide whether they wanted to take this on. It's not for the faint of heart, I can tell you that, to take on a policy like this. Um, when we started, I only knew of uh, a couple of other places in the country that were doing it. Uh, University of Virginia has had a policy for about a year or so longer than we have, um, and Driscoll Children's Hospital has had a policy for a bit longer. Uh, but since that time, uh, a number of other places, uh, Medical University of South Carolina has started one, University of Pittsburgh Medical Centers with their 20 hospitals have one. Um, there are a couple of others that have, uh, have adopted policies. There are also support from uh, professional organizations. So the CPPH um, drafted a, a long statement in support of policies like this in 2015. And when I look at their draft policy, it looks a lot like ours. Um, so I, I take that as a, a little bit of a compliment. Uh, the American College of Surgeons released a statement in 2016 in support of evaluating and supporting aging physicians. And they, in fact, uh, said that although they didn't pick a particular age, they thought 65 to 70 was probably the right age to be evaluating surgeons. And then the AMA, the American Medical Association, put out uh, a statement. The Council on uh, Medical Education put out a statement in 2015. And I put, I put a a pretty long quote from them because I think it all uh, all the points here are pertinent. So one thing is that they said that physicians should be allowed to remain in practice as long as patient safety is not endangered and that if needed remediation should be a supportive ongoing and proactive process and I can't emphasize that enough. No 
organization that has put out a statement, the CPPPH or uh, American College of Surgeons or AMA, nobody is saying that physicians need to retire at a certain age, and they're recognizing that we all age differently. Um, and they all say that we need to let people practice as long as they can safely, um, but and, and that we need to support people as they meet challenges. So it's not like an on-off switch, as you well know. It's not you're perfectly fine one day and you're really not the next. And so there are, if you're able to intervene early enough uh, or recognize that there are problems early enough, you may be able to intervene in such a way that can actually be helpful, allow a physician to, and I keep saying physician, but I really mean practitioners. Uh, advanced practice professionals can fit into this category as well. Um, but allow the practitioner to continue to practice in a way that is meaningful, but may not include all the things that they used to do in the past. The AMA also said that self-regulation is an important aspect of medical professionalism and that helping colleagues recognize their declining skills is an important part of self-regulation. And I'll talk a little bit more about recognizing di uh, declining skills in a minute. They said, so physicians then have to develop guidelines and standards for monitoring and assessing both uh, our own and our colleagues' uh, competency. And they suggested that formal guidelines on the uh, timing and content of testing of compliance may be appropriate and may head off uh, a call for mandatory retirement ages or imposition of guidelines by others. And so, to be honest, that's one of the things that we thought about when we first started talking about uh, developing a policy at Stanford in 2011, was we wanted to get out in front we knew this was going to be a difficult um, thing to tackle. And we also knew that um, as we got into it, there's no perfect answer to this. And so we wanted to be sure that we were doing something thoughtfully that we thought was meaningful as we went forward with this. I mentioned recognizing limitations. Many of us do recognize our limitations as we get older. Many um, aging uh, practitioners uh, cut back, do less, not just because they don't want to, but maybe they don't feel quite as comfortable doing some of the things that they used to be able to do before. They don't feel they have the stamina for maybe a surgeon who is used to operating for, uh, you know, standing in the OR for 10, 12, or more hours. That may just get to be a little too much, and so people tend to cut back. Um, but not everybody recognizes, whether you're a physician or not, not everybody recognizes our own limitations and competencies. Even if we don't have any kind of impairment, recognizing your own limitations is not always easy. As uh, any of us get older and develop cognitive impairment, one of the things that I learned from our chair of neurology, who has a, uh, a cognitive impairment uh, practice, is, first I learned this word, anosognosia. Anosognosia is a lack of awareness of limitation or of a problem. And, and in older, uh, and not older, in people who are developing cognitive impairment who were previously okay, um, they often, typically actually, don't recognize this. And sometimes they're even angry as they are, as it's pointed out to them. He describes the typical patient being uh, brought to his office by a spouse, sort of almost dragged kicking and screaming and very angry that the spouse has made them come to the cognitive impairment clinic because they know there's nothing wrong with them. Um, just uh, interestingly, as I was talking about our policy a few years ago to a group of physicians, there was a group of um, older practitioners in the back who have been opposed to our policy from the beginning. So again, this isn't for the faint of heart. There are people who really are opposed to this type of policy. But there was a group of older physicians in the back listening to our chair of neurology say the things that I just said, and they just about that time got up and stormed out. So I thought it was amusing that they were so angry that we're pointing out that as we decline, they were uh, becoming more angry, just as the chair of neurology had just told us. And then self-monitoring alone isn't adequate. One of our, uh, one of the real opponents of our policy, and I've had many, many conversations with him, um, will say, I'll know when I'm impaired, and don't you think that people around me would report me if I were? And the reality is that physicians and others are really reluctant to report their peers. 
Um, they don't want to talk about problems of competency, and even if they do, even if they think, and, and about half, in a couple of studies that I looked at, about half of the physicians polled said they would, uh, they would uh, report concerns. For those who would not, some of them, a vast majority of them thought somebody was already taking care of it or that somebody else had already reported it. And I think um, of one of my colleagues, one of the organizations, one of the institutions I mentioned has since developed a late career practitioner policy themselves, modeled a little bit after ours. Uh, they had a very prominent faculty member, nationally prominent faculty member, who became demented and was profoundly demented by the time he finally retired. Uh, people would, you know, sort of, as I mentioned before, shuttle him around, send him somewhere else. Uh, when he couldn't find his office and didn't know where he was, that's when he retired. And so we, and people were talking about him behind his back. People were talking about him across the country, and that's not ever what we want for any of our colleagues or for ourselves. So let me tell you a little bit about our policy. Um, and then I'm happy to answer any questions and, and raise a few questions, actually. So in our policy, um, we decided, uh, and I, I don't want to use the term arbitrarily, chose the age 75, but after looking for the right age, we realized there's not a right age. Um, and I can go into more detail if you'd like, but uh, we decided that 75 was a reasonable age to start screening physicians for impairment. Uh, we also decided that if we found, uh, as we started doing this, that a lot of people were seen to have impairment, we'd change the age. We'd lower it. Sorry. Uh, so we decided uh, that uh, physicians who are 75 years or older would undergo a, a peer uh, clinical skills assessment um, and a health screen every two years, and that health screen is really to assess the competence of the physician to perform the privileges that they have at, at our organization. So uh, when we have the physician um, get their physical exam, we provide the examiner with a list of the privileges that they have. So clearly um, a radiologist uh, doesn't necessarily have to have steady hands, but you would imagine that a neurosurgeon might. Um, so we want people uh, that are doing the exams to have a sense of what it is they're looking for. And when we ask for a reply from them, we don't want them to tell us everything that they found on the exam. That would be a violation of, of uh, privacy acts. Um, but we just want to say, are there concerns raised? And then we can look further into what we need to do. We do not have a cognitive screen in our current policy. We did when we started. Um, there are some significant challenges to cognitive screens. Um, we started with a cognitive screen in 2012. Uh, we had a group of physicians who were quite opposed to the policy, and so at that time I was the chief of staff. I put the policy on hold um, and got a group together again to look at the literature, and as we developed this policy, we had looked at a lot of literature. We had attorneys and physicians at you know, both ends of their careers and community docs and uh, um, faculty and uh, the, um, I think I said attorneys, but we had our medical staff attorney help us and the Office of General Counsel help, help us. Um, we did a lot of, and, and there were more, the chair of our neurology department, the chair of our psychiatry department. Um, put this together and we reviewed the literature, but when the um, physicians who were opposed challenged it, I pulled together a group, again, totally different people. I asked four people who were very much in favor of the policy to sit on the task force. I asked four people who were terribly opposed to it to sit on the task force. I asked four people who were agnostic about the policy or the idea of a policy to sit on the task force. I had lay um, people sit on the task force, and I had the chair of our ethics committee. So they looked at the policy. They reviewed even more literature than we had reviewed writing the policy, um, and they wrote a recommendation. The people who were very opposed wrote a separate recommendation from the task force, and we ultimately put uh, the, the policy to a vote of the full medical staff. Um, and the, it was passed by the medical staff. 
for anybody who knows anything or has seen anything about what's going on with our policy, uh, the group that's opposed has been very active in trying to um, have it rescinded or um, uh, taken back in some way, and they've gone to the Faculty Senate of the school, the School of Medicine, they've gone to the Faculty Senate twice of the university. Um, the Faculty Senate at the university um, opposed the policy. Um, m most of those faculty are not physicians, and we're really thinking about, we've been at this a long time, we worked hard for our careers, you can't know what to do. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Um, but this is a medical staff policy. It's not a university policy. It's not a hospital policy. The medical staff voted to keep the policy in place, and so that's what we've done. So we restarted um, in 2013 with an amended policy. We did get one because when this group looked again at the literature, they couldn't find support for a cognitive screen that would has been shown to protect patients from physicians who were not uh, still capable of providing good care. My own bias is that because nobody had looked, but that's an editorial comment. What I did find, though, was that uh, there is support for rigorous peer review as a way to assess physicians' competence to perform their duties. And so what we did was we took what was a kind of wimpy um, peer review process before. We asked a practitioner to give us the names of six colleagues, assess them. We chose three, um, and we had those people um, uh, fill a, a, a complete a form that we uh, was an adaptation of what we use for our um, appointments and promotions process in this university or in the school. We changed that and we said, okay, what we're going to do because the literature would support, you know, six and twenty-one peer reviews and more of a three hundred and sixty, so not just uh, physician colleagues, but peer review, robust peer review uh, can actually uncover problems. So we then decided that the service chief um, for each practitioner would give us the names, us meaning the, um, the, the credentials committee in particular, the names of um, eight to 10 people who were in a position to judge the physician's competency. And uh, we would then get evaluations from them. And that can include physician colleagues, uh, it can include uh, trainees, so relos. It can include uh, nurse practitioners or, uh, or practice nurse coordinators who know their practice well. As you um, can imagine, many of the people that we're talking about practice a couple of days a week. They practice sometimes only in a clinic, and they, they don't have a lot of physician colleagues around them who would have any sense of practice um, adequately. So that's what we've done with our, um, our current policy, and if concerns are raised in this screen, then we evaluate further. If it turns out that a radiologist was going blind or that, um, you know, a surgeon was no longer able to, um, you know, to really grip a knife, how, what else can we do to help this person? If it turns out that they just hate and can't adapt to the electronic medical record, we can get them scribes or help with the EMR. So there are things that we can do, but first we want to really see, is there a problem? These are, this is just a screen. It doesn't mean it is a diagnostic test that says there is definitely a problem. Next thing we do is take another step, see if there really is a problem that the screen suggests there might be, and then move on. As I mentioned before, the whole idea is to put well-being of patients above other, above other issues. It's not about us. It's about our patients. Um, and we can uh, do this uh, in, a, in a humanistic way. Um, and, our, and again, our goal is really not to embarrass anybody. We're trying to do exactly the opposite. If we do see concerns, then the department um, or the service, depending on whether it's in the school or, um, or a community, decide what else needs to be done. For example, if the peer um, comments suggest there may be a cognitive problem, we can send them for further cognitive evaluation. If, uh, if it's something that looks like a substance abuse um, issue, we have a well-being committee that we can send people to, and they monitor them very closely and help them with their problems. Um, we do not restrict privileges right off the bat. I mean, our goal is to support people and allow them to practice to the best of their ability. If it turns out that they're not, then we would restrict their privileges. So 
uh, it's the last resort. It's not, it's not our go-to um, move. Our policy has been in place now for, depending on where you want to start counting, 2012 or 2013, um, four or five years ago, and about 60 physicians have been screened um, under this policy. Now, um, since it's been in place that long, and we screen every two years, um, almost half have gone through, or about half have gone through this screen now twice. Three physicians um, of those 60, three physicians have been found to have um, uh, issues that we uh, then decided to pursue further cognitive screen. One, um, we were able to, uh, to really help, and he's remained in practice. The other two, uh, decided that they would rather retire. They were faculty members. They decided they would rather retire from their practice in the on the faculty than to go through the screen. And we actually, our policy allowed for for-cause screening of physicians who are younger than 75. So if concerns are raised about an individual that um, uh, make us think they may not be capable of practicing safely, we can have them go through this screen as well. And we have had one physician who was younger than 75 go through the screen for cause. It turned out that he was found to be okay. He was just getting more crotchety as he got older, but not less competent. Um, and when we first started this, um, I called, at that time there were just under 30 physicians who were over 75, and I called every single one of them to tell them that this pile was coming, um, and told them why and what we were, you know, what we were trying to do. Most of them were very much in favor. They said, "Oh, yeah, it's, that's about time." Uh, we've all known people who should have retired before they did. A few people were, you know, okay, one more thing. I mean, there were a small handful, probably two or three, who were very, very opposed. Um, some of those people did, just not the people who were very, very opposed, they're still practicing actually um, and doing a good job of it. Um, but some people decided that it just wasn't worth it. They would retire anyway. There were a couple who really didn't need medical staff privileges. They stayed on the faculty to um, do their research and their teaching, but they really weren't practicing. And so they didn't need medical staff privileges. And so they retired from the medical staff um, because they, didn't, they really just didn't need to do that and then continued on the faculty. So we've learned a few things. One is that we can actually do this. Um, so that was something we weren't sure about in the beginning. We weren't sure we could do it well. Um, our psychiatry chair said there's nothing you can, there's no good screen that you can use. Our neurology chair said there's no good screen you can use. And the more we looked at it, the more they actually are the ones who helped us figure out what, what we wanted to do. Um, this has, uh, we have both community faculty physicians and a pretty complicated you know, structure, and even with that, we've been able to, to do this. Um, it, this has allowed the medical staff to represent yet another element of competency and quality assurance, and it's certainly um, our policy and others, I think, have really increased the visibility of this issue over the last um, few years. I can't say this enough. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. I really think this is an important thing for us to do, but it's not easy and it's not cheap. So there are some questions, and this is my last slide. The questions really are, what is the right age? We can, you know, I can tell you what I know from what I've read and what I think, um, but that's a real question. And we actually, of the people who have policies, the uh, places that have policies that I'm aware of, we have the oldest um, age limit. Others are 70. Um, how often should it be done? In Canada, they, they screen five years. We screen every two. Um, I don't know that there's a right answer, but we thought that as people get older, five years was an awful long time to wait. So we do it every two years. What type of assessment or screening? We're one of the few, if not maybe the only one, that doesn't use some kind of a cognitive screen. I think you have to have a good cognitive screen or it's not very helpful. The first one I saw, people used a mini mental status exam, and I don't know, uh, how, so I know some of you are familiar with that. I don't know if everyone is, but it's a, if you can't pass the mini mental status exam, you shouldn't be driving a car much less practicing medicine. So you've got to have a screen that's actually valuable, and I think that's a real challenge. Um, how do you uh, integrate the policy with existing reappointment and credentialing processes? We decided um, that we would do it at the same cadence as our reappointment process, but we didn't necessarily time it at the same exact time of the reappointment, just because our medical staff services department um, 
you know, got this really panicked look on their face when we thought we would associate the two, because it's already hard enough for them to get everything they need for reappointment. But if someone has been reappointed and then we find problems, we don't wait till their next reappointment to, uh, to raise the issue and to address it. This is not cheap. If, if you do something like the microcog exam or use uh, PACE, the um, position assessment and clinical uh, education program at uh, UC San Diego, it's a couple of thousand dollars at least for the screen. And if you do more detailed, it can be five or more times that for a real good uh, exam. Some places have um, put something local in effect, but it's still not cheap. For, and, and it's not something that people want to pay. They don't really want to pay for the torture of being screened. We used the microcog when we first started. And, and uh, at that time, I think we were charging about $1,200. Our own people were charging us $1,200 to do it. I took it because I figured I can't ask people to do something that I'm afraid to do myself. And I, it was a little intimidating, I can tell you. So the idea of who's going to pay for this is not a simple question. And then we also have to be sure that the policy is rationally related to patient care. We haven't been able to demonstrate yet that a cognitive screen is. In my heart, I think it probably is. And it seems reasonable that it would be. We don't have evidence. Again, I think it's mostly because Nobody's studied it. There aren't but a few places that even have policies like this. So those are the questions that I think we really have to grapple with. Um, I do think that we need to be looking um, at ourselves as we get older. Um, there are ways to maybe to promote this idea without mandating it because, you know, an unfunded mandate isn't going to help us very much. We could have uh, our professional organizations really uh, emphasize the need for the, this kind of um, oversight. Uh, uh, Third-party payers could offer discounts, maybe, for people who voluntarily undergo some kind of screening. I think one of the challenges is that in a in a, a hospital where you're surrounded by a lot of people, um, it's a lot easier to recognize when there's a problem than if you a lone practitioner who's the only person in a small community offering medical care to a lot, who's going to be able to evaluate that person? And how are they going to afford it? And how's the community going to afford it? I mean, so I think we have a lot of questions to answer before deciding that we're going to do this or we're going to mandate this. But I think we really need to be, need to be um, asking at least institutions, hospitals, to start looking at their medical staff and put in some kind of a policy that will look at practitioners as we get older. I have no idea if I went over time. I don't see a clock, but. Thank you, Dr. Renick. It's an excellent presentation. I think we're all struggling with this, um, especially in the hospitals. My medical staff went through whether to or not to. We haven't come to a conclusion yet. Uh, but that's not a place I worry most about, like you mentioned. I think what I worry most about is a solo practice doc somewhere, uh, even a solo uh, plastic surgeon, solo ophthalmologist, because many of them never go to hospital. Right, yep. I mean, it's operating at their own surgery center, and uh, that's that. That scares me more than anything else because they are putting consumers at risk. If, and these are, uh, even though the cataract operation takes 20 minutes in an average person, but it is one of the most dangerous operations you can do. Somebody can lose their vision. So uh, it's, um, I think we'll get there. I was there at AMA, uh, I'm one of the AMA delegates, when 2015 we oh. took it on mm -hmm. to talk about uh, what do we do with the senior physicians? So, uh, questions from the board? Yes, Dr. Kraus. I admire and appreciate uh, your work on this. It's critically important. When I reviewed uh, our agenda with my 98-year-old father the other day, he said, Howard, if you do speak to this issue, it's important for you to reveal your conflict of interest. <laughs> uh, I am 68 years old. <laughs> One never knows personally when you're too old. So I have set dates in my mind. I'll stop operating when I'm 75. I'll stop working when I'm 80. But maybe I won't have the cognitive and technical skill to those dates. You know, when you're gonna, going to get a license to drive two to three tons of metal on the public highways uh, where you could kill yourself and others, 
Uh, the Motor Vehicle Bureau, I think, does a better job of assessing people who apply for driver's licenses than we do in monitoring our physicians. The Medical Board waits for problems. We, we wait for complaints. Uh, and although cognitive and technical decline does increase with age, whether it be because of substance abuse or lack of ethics or illness, there are physicians who suffer cognitive and technical decline at any age. Uh, so I don't know how we get there. You know, when you say we have to depend on our professional societies, well, what our professional society decided to do is promote maintenance of certification where you take a test every 10 years, and that does not demonstrate cognitive or technical ability. Hospitals are accredited. Periodically, there's a team of surveyors that descend on a hospital and they look at everything. Ambulatory surgery centers, of which I'm a partner in one, are audited. My ambulatory surgery center pays $17,000 every three years for the cost of the accreditation. There's nothing like on-site evaluation. I don't know the practicality of it, but I would like to think that there could be on-site evaluation of physicians. Maybe the physician would have to pay the costs of it. Uh, what should the time spread be? I don't know, maybe every 10 years in early career and every two years in, in late career. But there's nothing that tells you as much as standing next to a physician, watching that physician in his clinic that day, watching the physician in the operating room. Not only will you learn about that physician's cognitive and technical ability, you'll learn a whole lot about how he or she conducts himself, his behavior, uh, the ethics of the practice, uh, whether or not laws are being violated. Uh, I don't know how to get there. Uh, I think if we had some system of on-site evaluation periodically, that would be much more compelling and accurate than any kind of cognitive testing we could dream up. But this is a critically important issue. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think you make a valid point that observing a physician, or whatever practitioner, uh, in practice, do you do that for a couple of hours? Do you do it for a couple of days? Do you do it for a couple of weeks? I mean, you know, I think those are, like you say, there's some significant practical issues to be dealt with. Do you do that for every physician everywhere, people who practice in hospitals and they're surrounded by, you know, a team of physicians and nurses um, in the OR? Do you do it only for people who are out in, you know, a practice where there's the, they're the only physician or they're one of two or maybe three? I mean, I don't know what the right answer is, and, and I think that, as you say, our professional society, certainly in terms of maintenance of certification, that's a whole other 25-minute you know, talk. Now, we've seen um, many cases where the local community ignores things. Uh, I think when an outside surveyor comes in, they're not biased by the fact that they're part of the team or they have a personal relationship with this physician or they're going to have a meeting with that physician next week. So mm -hmm. I think we need to look for objective ways of of monitoring this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think one of the one of the things that I, I heard and I mentioned as an option um, is maybe having third having malpractice or third party payers or whoever um, uh, give discounts for you know malpractice maybe give discounts for physicians who will undergo uh, voluntary evaluation because um, that money would certainly be a, a reason for many of us to say. Yeah, I'll do it, um, even if we're doing it kicking and screaming. But that might be a way to do it. I, I mean, I don't know what the right answer is. Ron, 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 Ron. Oh, one second. Dr. Levine, then Mr. Warmoth, and then Dr. Lewis. Yeah, so um, thank you. This is very helpful and, and useful information, and it points out, as you said, this isn't easy and, and or cheap. And I think one of the challenges, and we've heard this from the presenters in the past, is the absence of um, normative standards for cognitive testing of physicians. And, and when you look at, you know, on average, or at least in general, where the IQ that a physician starts with, unless you've got the ability to measure decline from baseline, um, the, the existing cognitive assessment um, it is normative for the population, not for a, you know, a, a high IQ, mm -hmm. high performing group. And, and it's a challenge for us at the board because, um, you know, 
I mean, I suppose one option, and I've talked with Kim about this a million times, is, you know, do we look at um, a policy or, or, or at, for us it would require legislation saying that when a physician comes before the board on a quality of care issue after a certain age, one of the routine requirements is, is a cognitive assessment. That would be easy to do if we had a reliable tool that could measure um, you know, this, the, this physician's performance against 100,000 physicians yeah. in the specialty uh, performing uh, at, this, at this point in time with both a knowledge base and information processing. And how we get there, I think, I mean, clearly, I think we need some investment of resources in, set in d developing those normative standards. Yeah, the microcog has been validated in physicians, so that is one of the very few that mm -hmm. is a screen. I mean, it's not the full thing. And then, if you really want the full thing, if the if the screen suggests, just like when you you know do a uh, look for occult blood in stool, right? It doesn't mean you have colon cancer, right? It means you could, and so you do something next. And so that I think is how you would have to approach any of these, and that's how we were approaching the microcog when we were using it. Uh, but So then you take them to something further, and there are about seven, I think, across the country programs. PACE, obviously, is easy for us because it's, you know, just around the corner, sort of. Um, easy, not cheap, but it's, it's, it, and it does give you a much greater evaluation, and it's over a couple of days, as, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, so I, I think part of why, uh, if we were to legislate something that uh, says that physicians have to be evaluated. Um, to do rigorous peer review, at least in places like hospitals where people have privileges to practice and there are other people who could evaluate their practice, um, and, and peer review of quite a few people, not just, you know, a couple, um, that might be a way until we come up with something better or a way to fund this. Um, but I, I, think we, I think we need to be insisting that we look at practitioners as we get older, but there are problems and we're not always reporting it. And we've only in, in four and a half-ish years um, of looking at 60 physicians have only found three people that we think have problems. So it's not like, at least in our organization, it's not like we've got a bunch of demented old people walking around. Let me say, I'm 67, so I'm, you know, I'm, I got a vested interest in this too. It's less than 10 years and I'm up for this screen. Um, but I, I do think that it's an important thing for us to be, to be paying attention to. Mr. Rodman. Uh, one of the common threads that I heard from your presentation uh, from uh, physicians that are objecting to the idea is uh, that they're being singled out somehow. That, uh, you know, uh, I'll know when it's a problem. Uh, that guy just wants parking space, whatever the issue is. We don't have parking spaces, so. <laughs> but uh, uh, it would seem to me that if rather than waiting for a report, there was a specific uh, age-related uh, testing scheme that all doctors have to uh, go through, there would not be the issue of I'm being singled out. Uh, and, you know, parenthetically also, the, uh, I think the age makes a difference too that seems to me at 75 most to the point where that's the tipping point where you have to prove that you're okay. Uh, rather than that, uh, you know, the assumption is you're okay up until then. I would say that we probably, I, I don't know, uh, uh, require that all, all physicians go uh, begin testing at 60. Uh, another one at 65, or, or uh, excuse me, another one at 70, uh, another one at 75 every two years after that something like that would just be a way to uh, uh, put the onus on, on not dealing with any kind of personality issues. It's just that, you know, this is what we think is necessary to make sure that 
all doctors are to practice. Yeah, I, 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 I think I basically agree with you. I mean, what the age is, though, I mean, we did do that. We just chose an older age than what you're suggesting. One of our surgeons said we were crazy, that six, 75 was much too old for our surgeons. Um, the, the American College of Surgeons says 65 to 70. Know what the right age is? To kind of the point that um, Dr. Levine made a minute ago, um, physicians were not immune, but physicians have sort of a, a cushion. Most of us are, um, well, we're certainly highly educated, presumably quite intelligent, let's hope. Um, and the rate of decline as we get older for physicians or for any really well-educated person, um, person who was able to be well-educated, um, is slower than for the general public. Um, but somewhere around 70, that rate of decline, uh, 75 rather, that rate of decline kind of becomes the same. So there is a difference um, in the rate of decline of the general public when compared to highly intelligent, highly uh, educated um, people. But I don't know what the right age is. I mean, you know, pilots start having some kind of exams at age 40. Um, th different people, you know, FBI agents have to retire at a, at a given age. So there's, there's certainly something to it. It's just when do we start and how in the world do we actually operationalize and pay for this? I mean, I think that's where part of it is. And so I think if we started at 60, which is not a totally unreasonable idea, we'll just have more angry people than, right? I mean, I think because whatever age you pick, unless it's 35, and even at 35, it's like, are you kidding me? I've got enough to do. Um, but I think whatever age you pick, you're going to have people who are in that age bracket are going to say, WT, what the heck, right? So. so Dr. Lou, I'll take you as your last comment from the board because the next group of presenters, they have a flight they don't want to miss. Okay, well, let so me, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get moving. Um, I'm on the mic here. I'm, I'm just talking here. Uh, okay, so okay. any comments from the, yes, ma'am, come on I'm in. I'm not, wait a minute, I'm yes. not commenting? I'll take, oh, oh, good, yes. okay. So I thought you, you said no, thank you, but no, come no, on no. in, please. One more chance to apply. I know. You were like brushing me off the stage. I don't know <laughs> if that like, one works. Oh. It didn't work when I tried it. You can come over here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hello. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, just a quick question: How does their board examinations to factor with all this? We have to take board examinations every ten years and pay a lot of money for that. Yeah. And <coughs> don't we have to pass our examinations in order to be able to qualify at sixty and seventy? I'm you, assuming. Uh, you do. Uh, it's every ten years. Um, they, do, they don't really speak to your ability to practice. They, they do say that you've been able to learn and answer questions. The questions may or may not be related to what you actually do. If you're a surgeon, they certainly don't. But they're board specific, right? So you're, I mean, Sorry, I don't for, take. For public comment, please, please make your comment. <laughs> you've got Sorry, so I guess my, my comment would just not be. not back and forth. We <laughs> do have a 10 year, there is a designation and it's an expensive designation to your specific board qualified um, specialty. It's mm -hmm. not like an emergency physician takes a internal medicine, you know, specialty board yeah, exam. Right. So, I mean, if you're going to now put, I, and I don't disagree, I'm just, I want another factor to be considered, which is we do take these examinations, and if they don't have meaning, then why would we have to sit and spend another $2,000 plus for these examinations every 10 years? Why, why, uh, why force <coughs> that if that's not going to be helpful? Dr. Know? Winokur, actually, I... That, that will take the next hour to answer. Yeah, you, right. you, yeah. you know that so. And all the debates around uh, maintenance of we, certification. We, we, and we don't want to go into MOC and uh, recertification. Oh, that's and all of the stuff that people are objecting to the every 10 year exam. Yeah. MOC and all of those other Yes. So AMA spent entire afternoon on that and we still come, uh, couldn't come to a conclusion on that. Dr. Lewis. Okay, let, let me go on because I'm gonna forget <laughs> as my cognitive ability goes down. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't agree um, with taking a test is going to prove that you're a good physician. Right. I think, as Dr. Krauss said, you do need to observe because people are good test takers. So to test every five years or 10 years does not prove to me that you're anything but a good test taker. Also, you have a computer system, Cerner or Epic or something. I'm sure at Stanford you have something. We do. Whatever you call it. Epic And you can have. glean a lot of data from that on 
you know, how fast the physician is, uh, mistakes they make, uh, adverse outcomes. So you can get a trend and look at these physicians with some of the tools you have and initially, and you don't need to put another physician at their, from hip to hip which is the way you're going to observe them if HIPAA will allow you to do that. So that's my comment. Test taking, um, I was not a good test taker, but some people are, and they're not very good physicians, so thank yeah. you. I think, I think you're absolutely right about that. I think, like I said, I took the microcog just because I thought I had to. I couldn't ask people, and it's not something that you could study for. I mean, it's really... It's 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 calculating, figuring, it's remembering things that you've just read. It's um, how long does it take to? I mean, it, it's not the kind of test that you can really study for. I think the boards and those kinds of things, even the MOC, is just to your point, it doesn't necessarily tell you anything. But I, I don't know what the right answer is, and that's why most. I mean, everything that I've last you know few weeks getting, making sure that I've seen the most recent. Um, uh, thoughts on this, people aren't really necessarily suggesting a cognitive screen, probably for the same reason that we haven't, because, um, and, and the point that Dr. Levine made, uh, there's not the perfect cognitive screen out there, or if there is, just haven't been able to prove it. Thank you. Ms. Lawson. Yeah, I just have a, a, a question about whether or not this type of late practitioner policy at your facility or at others ever works in tandem with sort of a more corporate succession planning um, or transition of knowledge policy because I, I'm not a physician, but in the law firm context, uh, I am an attorney and in the corporate context, they've had success in those um, knowledge transition or leadership transition processes in um, not incentivizing or encouraging, um, but but having folks that are older invested in the next generation, um, if you will, such that they that the sort of self um, forced retirement comes more easily to them mm -hmm. uh, before they really feel like they've almost gotten too far and then don't have anyone to pass along their knowledge or wisdom to. So my question, um, to be succinct, is really whether succession planning um, and and that transition is a part of the thinking on these policies. You know it. Part of the thinking, yes. Part of the action, no. Um, the school, the, the, the School of Medicine, um, even a few years before we did this, put together um, a, tried to put together something like faculty as they got later in their career and were thinking about making the transition to, um, to retirement or to semi-retirement. And it, it was pretty difficult and it never really got legs. Um, but I, honestly, I'd love to hear more about what you um, what you do, how you operationalize that, and what that actually means, because I think that we need to do that. As I said, um, you know, when I got started, this isn't our job. This is who we are. And I suspect that for anybody who has spent a lot of time doing, you know, for attorneys and for other people who have spent a lot of time training to do a job well and have done it well for a long, long time, it's part of who we are. And so if you, I'd love to hear what you've got to, I mean, honestly, Maybe we can connect later. I'd, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? If not public comment, yes, ma'am. Come on. Hi, I'm Wendy Connor. I spoke earlier on this topic. First of all, sex doesn't work because the last one to know he has Alzheimer's is the guy who has it. Peer review is too loaded because you can't really s report your superior without some ramification. It's, it's too close. There needs to be something standardized and impersonal, and it needs to be taken into account that medicine is a unique field where people suddenly hit the wall and got to leave. Every profession has an end, um, and it's not just doctors who face that aging process. It's everyone who has a profession. And so if you take out that specialness, you realize this is just part of the cycle. Australia starts their testing at age 70. Kaiser makes their physicians retire at 65. The guy who blinded me in one eye was 74, one year shy of testing, and he already had 72 malpractice suits under his belt. That's why we were 2260 regarding gag clauses. Because of the gag clauses, nobody knew he had those 72 malpractice suits. 75 is just too late. You know, you take the case of Dr. Bernard Sernat, 
who I mentioned earlier was licensed in 1937 and died at the age of nine while performing a surgery. At some time, you've got to say enough is enough. You're not going to get on a plane with a 99-year-old pilot. You shouldn't be taking a surgery with a 99-year-old doctor. Even if he seems sharp as a tack when he walks into that operating room, you're kind of playing fire if you just don't recognize, and you're doctors, you're all physicians. You know we have an aging process. At 14, maybe you'd go on the balance beam and do a flip. I seriously doubt if anyone on this board, or even myself, would consider going on the balance beam at this point in life. We all just in our lives. And it's not just doctors, it's every profession. It's a reality, and it needs to be addressed with something standardized and impersonal, and it just is. So a doctor cannot take it personal, a doctor, you know, people cannot take it personal. It's got to be uniform, standardized, and it's, it's a reality. Thank you. Thank you. At least I can tell you, even at age 14, I didn't want to go on balance beam. <laughs> Any other comments from the audience? Oh, OK. All right. Dr. Okay. Levine. Yeah, I, I don't want you to leave, think, leave the impression that Kaiser Permanente physicians are required to retire at 65. That's not the case. Um, Southern California is a partnership. And so when you reach 65, you have to change your employment status. But if you're interested in continuing to practice and are going to private practice. No, no, not the case. You can continue to practice with the Southern California group. It's just a diff not as a partner, but as an employed physician. And in the other uh, Kaiser medical groups around the country, there is no mandatory retirement age. There is a mandatory um, age uh, of uh, leaving leadership role, but that has nothing to do with competence. It's more about creating opportunities for younger physicians to assume it. So there's, there's, as there is at Stanford, there's a lot of, it's a large group practice, there's a lot of rigorous peer review, but there is no mandatory retirement age at 65. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Any on the phone? Any comments on the phone? We're showing no comments from the phone lines. Thank you. It looked like somebody went to sleep. Um, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Renko. So moving on to the item number nine, a presentation on the sobering centers and mental health urgent care center. At the last meeting, members requested a presentation on these types of facilities. Uh, would Dr. Smith Bernadine and Dr. Kazan please come forward? Dr. Smith, yeah. Dr. Smith Bernadine is the Director of Clinical Services at Housing for Health in Los Angeles Department of Health Services, overseeing the medical and nursing service uh, integration with uh, recuperative cares, sobering centers, and homeless street engagement services. Dr. Kazan is filling in for, for Dr. Mackey. Go ahead, please. So um, thank you for having us back. My name is Clayton Kazan, a uh, physician, uh, double boarded in EMS and emergency medicine, uh, and the medical director of the Los Angeles County Fire Department. Uh, first, I also want to thank you for allowing me to speak at the January meeting and for your willingness to listen uh, and support EMS physicians as we try to improve the care of our mental health and intoxicated patients in the arena. Uh, I'm here today in place of Dr. Mackey, who was called to work in the emergency room so he couldn't travel from Sacramento today. Uh, Kevin is the principal investigator for one of the community paramedicine pilot projects um, in Stanislaus County, in which he has specially trained community paramedics, uh, use instrument to transport select mental health patients uh, directly to a mental health center. And I believe you have a presentation from him in your materials. I'm just going to hit the highlights. I, I can't do Kevin justice. But um, one of the big things is that the top priority for this is providing a better outcome for the That is number one. Um, there have been some questions raised about the, um, the incentives behind this. The, the primary goal of this project is to provide better health care for really um, needy patients. 
the current practice of allowing these patients to languish in our emergency rooms uh, for hours and days cannot really be considered in best interest, uh, especially when the majority receive uh, really no medical interventions um, and they, they just languish and wait for an eventual disposition. Um, there is a reduced cost associated with this. And for population health, the recidivism rate for these patients when they present to our emergency departments, our status quo system is exceedingly high and expensive because the ERs don't have the intensive resources that the patients need um, in order to get better. So they don't get better, and they just keep accessing the system. Um, so what Kevin developed is very similar to what we've developed for really all specialty center support patients, too. So the patients um, get an initial screen from firefighters that respond. Um, and what he calls it, he calls it his well-person algorithm. It's a very basic screen. Do they have any clear medical issues that preclude them from getting a more detailed assessment by his community paramedics? If the answer is yes, they're just immediately transfer department. If the answer is no, they will continue in their specialized community paramedic unit that does a more detailed assessment. Those community paramedics have received a significant amount of additional training. They perform their triage tool. If their triage tool shows that the patients have no acute medical need, they'll do a bed to determine if there are available beds in the mental health centers that they have agreements with. If there are available beds and the patient consents and they meet this, the triage tool, then they're transported to those mental health centers. At the mental health center, they receive another screen. If the mental health center agrees with the assessment, they take, if they disagree with the assessment, the patient is then brought to the emergency department. So at every level, there are ways of screening the patients and there are safety net mechanisms to repatriate the patients back into the current system if they don't meet these strict triage criteria. The end result of his data, um, he ended up 85 patients that were eligible, consented, and transported. Of the 285, 12 patients were ultimately transported back to an emergency department. Of those 12 patients, zero required hospitalization. So the total of 4.2% of patients went back to the emergency department. Nearly 96 were considered eligible and appropriate and stayed in the mental health center, and the outcomes were good. Um, and it, if it rings true that this is the way we have done a lot of our specialty care, it's because it is. So when we developed our trauma system or our STEMI system, we, again, we have a triage. So for a trauma patient in the field, we have a, a triage evidence-based. We, we train our paramedics on. If the patient meets the screening criteria, they get transported to the trauma center. If they don't, they get transported to a non-trauma center. At the non-trauma center, they get reassessed at triage. If the receiving hospital disagrees and thinks that the patient needs to go to a trauma center, we have built a mechanism in those patients and repatriate them back into the trauma system. It's done exactly the same way. That this is exactly what we're proposing for this system. We're really not recreating the wheel. Um, I think that Assemblymember Gibson's office has worked really diligently with the stakeholders in this process to really answer some of the questions and concerns. Um, and really, at the end of the day, this bill is not about the expansion of any paramedic scope of practice. It really is just a triage bill opening up two new destination centers for our paramedics to get the patient to the right level of care the first time and not have them languish in our ERs fill up our ER, ultimately get discharged without the care that they need, and end up in that endless cycle. So with that, I'll pass to you. So hello, I'm Shannon smith Bernadine, and I'm a registered nurse by trade and a PhD. And so for the last 10 years, I'm going to fast forward through Kevin's presentation here. I think mine most likely at the end of it. I have spent the last almost 11 years now working in sobering centers and doing research on the effectiveness of the sobering program um, as an alternative to the emergency department. Uh, currently now in Los Angeles, we have one sobering center that I'm working with amongst other um, homeless health care initiatives. And prior to this, I was spent 10 years in San Francisco at their, uh, in the work we've done up there. So this is, I put a picture of the San Francisco Sobering Center in here. I visited a number of programs across the country, but rather than going through an entire photo array, I just put one up. General Sobering Center has a bed for all the patients. Um, there's a new situation people use now, these pods, panel pods that they use are easier to clean um, and easier for clients to get into. Other ones here. Our target populations are people who are publicly intoxicated on alcohol. And similar to the triage that Dr. Kazan mentioned, 
is the paramedics do the same thing. They respond to a call. Someone's found down on the sidewalk. Their 911's called. Usually it's a passerby of that individual. Paramedics respond. They have a triage tool, which basically has a lot of yes, no questions, blood pressure at a certain level, pulse at a certain level, alter, uh, level of consciousness. Go through it. If there's any yeses, like they have it in a bad way, they go to the emergency department. If it's all no's and the client is agreeing to go to the sober, they'll come to the sobering center instead. And when they get to our program, basically they're greeted by a nurse, a registered nurse who's on staff and other support staff. They take vital signs, do an initial assessment of the individual, and then at that point, the patient's determined they're accepted into the program. If they're not appropriate, they are discharged back with the paramedics back to the emergency department. But we do track the data of anyone who's refused the site. It basically comes up as approximately a five minute stay with a note that says the client was brought in by paramedics and was discharged immediately to the emergency department for not having fit cr uh, admission criteria at that point. In uh, California now, there are eight sobering centers uh, throughout Los Angeles, up in San Mateo. Berlin Games had one for 20 years. San Diego's been in operation since the late 70s. Many of these sobering centers, you may have heard this, are they primarily work with the criminal justice system. They were created in the early 70s, actually, sobering centers in general, as a way to introduce people who were being seen frequently in the criminal justice system, model of care for alcohol use disorders at that point. So that's how sobering centers came about. It was a uniform act that went through the federal government in the early 70s. And so many programs initiated back then, Lots of us have kind of come up later. San Francisco's the last 15 years, Los Angeles the last one year and three months. So we're kind of brand new down here. And we are more, we're, we're planning for at least four different locations in Los Angeles County, for example, and there's other areas that are opening them now. And the typical visit, the client would come in, so they've gone through the triage protocol, they're admitted to the program, they have access to hygiene facilities, showers, et cetera, they get a bed to sleep in, we do vital sign monitoring every two to four hours. It's vital sign that seemed a little off when they first came in, but it's still within admission criteria, for example, a low blood pressure. They have the vital signs taken more frequently every 15 to 30 minutes until they hit a stable area. And then they basically can get rewarming. We do have a hypothermia protocol, which I know there's some confusion about that. We've always had one on, and we have lots of different items we use on site. During that time, they sober. Average length of stay is anywhere between six hours to 10 hours. They, we have sober coaches and social workers at some of the programs, the ones specifically looking at EMS triage, and along with the registered nurses who basically work with the individual. They can get case management from the group on site, both Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco practitioners on staff, not full time, but someone who can provide, say, bridging primary care or chronic disease management for individuals who we see frequently. Some individuals come to a sobering center, and this is pretty much where they go, the ED or sobering, upwards of 50 to 150 times a year. And these individuals that we're seeing in the ED over and over and over and over and over again didn't exist. And so we're seeing them said and trying to work with them to get them into detox, rehab, et cetera, or at least keep them stable and start engaging with them to get them better care. Nurse practitioners are on staff can help with chronic disease and some of our programs now are offering medications. They'll hold their blood pressure meds on site. When the person comes in, they sober up and then they can kind of be treated from that point. At that point, they discharge, they sobered up and safe to go. If anything happens during the stay, then they go to the emergency department. Uh, we do have a lot of emergency capability on site. The vast majority of programs have AEDs, oxygen, um, bag valve masks, the, anything that happens if someone actually were to decompensate quickly and while 911 is on its way. And the, we, everything is standardized procedures for the nurses uh, on site, which have been approved by physicians and <coughs> master's approved nurses uh, during that stage. We did do a study um, in San Francisco, it's starting the review process right now, looking at, we took three years of data of basically, so the folks who did come in and got sent to the emergency during their stay, that's really one of the main concerns, who had a negative outcome in the sobering center. We looked at three years of data of that of over 4,000 encounters directly by paramedics into the program in San Francisco, plus another 1,300 who were evaluated in the emergency department first and then came to the sobering center at some point by a van service that operates in San Francisco. And looking at those outcomes, we had uh, 151 out of over 4,000 brought in by, ambu by ambulance that end up going to the emergency department at some point during their stay. Uh, and then the van, you see approximately three to four percent. <coughs> Looking at the numbers over 15 years out of 15,000 encounters, that number of approximately 4% has stayed the same. No matter what happens, that just seems to be kind of the number. Looking at the reasons why people ended up going to the emergency department, 
as the pulse started elevating at some point. Now, alco alcohol withdrawal is a major concern for individuals with chronic alcohol use disorders, obviously. And with the population, I know, you know, all of us go through nursing and medical school, and it says people go into withdrawal. Around 24 hours, they start getting anxious. At 48 hours, now, with these folks, this is anywhere between two hours to eight hours is where alcohol withdrawal is really starting to set in, depending on where they live at with their blood alcohol level. Despite that, very few percent, 45, it's still one of the highest things. So pulse potentially related to that. Withdrawal was 45 out of the 151 had that as a sign of why they went out. And we do a really good job of making sure people can be, either go to detox or get discharged so they can get themselves another drink. It's the reality of this world. Um, before they go into withdrawal, so that's definitely not the goal. It's very uncomfortable for the clients. I think many of you would probably know that. Um, based histories of working with this population. Um, complaints of pain, and this includes clients who just want to go to the emergency department at the end of their stay. We will send them out, and a lot of situations happen that could not have necessarily, said, necessarily been screened by paramedics. They're intoxicated, they come in, and the alcohol's starting to wear off, and so now they start coughing because they actually have a flu going on, and then we'll send them to the emergency department at that point. And that's the end of my part of it there. Question and answers. Thank you both. Uh, actually, there, it's, a, uh, it's an issue where we look at it, I mean, I look at it as a trauma surgeon for the past 35. Uh, it it re re relieves the emergency room of unnecessary uh, care, entry and testing. But at the same time, I, do, I worry that are we taking some people who need medical care away into, I'm just, I, I want you, I, I know one of Dr. Kazan, you mentioned that uh, there is a protocol they follow, but even if you look at the protocols for trauma versus non-trauma, still they're going to a hospital. That is, you either go to a trauma center, you go to a non-trauma center by the personnel there, including an MD, DO, or a physician there. So I'm just, just wondering, is that, uh, the, how is that not, that hasn't been a problem? Uh, because it looks like Bay Station is never involved in this, in this process where they take, where do, so can you explain that to me? So different counties have different policies about when uh, the paramedic Bay Station is activated. Um, what I would tell you is I'm still a practicing emergency physician. I will be on graveyard shift tomorrow night uh, on 420, which is sometimes a scary prospect in the emergency department. Uh, these patients do get initially evaluated by emergency physicians at the hospital, but then they become one of the lowest priority patients. They get parked off in a corner. They get parked off in a hallway uh, because we have other things we have to worry about. We have higher priority patients. And while it's true that they get that initial screen, the vast majority of them require medical intervention whatsoever. We take one quick look at them. We ask them if they have any medical problems. We, can, it's, we basically perform the same screen we're gonna train the paramedics to perform. Whenever we do these triage processes, we are very, very conservative in the way that we set up the triage because nobody wants to see a patient who needs to be in the emergency department wine nation. Just as in the trauma world or the STEMI world, Nobody wants to see a STEMI patient arrive at a non-STEMI hospital. So we're very conservative about how we do the triage. We do continuous data gathering and continuous quality improvement. So in the 13 years that I've been in the, um, as an attending physician in art, I can tell you that the trauma guidelines have evolved quite a bit just in those 13 years. The STEMI system that didn't even exist when I started not only uh, has been created, but has also evolved over time to try to be more conservative and make sure that they capture all the patients, but yet at the same time not send every chest pain patient to a STEMI center. That is because we don't, we don't want to overload the STEMI centers or the trauma centers with everyone who bumps their head. We set up guidelines that are, not, that are sensitive but not overly sensitive but, and specific as, as best we can do without overloading the trauma system. All this does is the same thing, is we want to screen out the patients who are leading medical intervention so we don't overload the emergency department by continually sending these patients there. And the other thing I can tell you is that from Shannon's presentation, all those things that the sobering center offers those patients, and I've worked in several different emergency departments, we have none of those things to offer those patients. Yeah, I, I, I think I got uh, Just a still a concern hasn't gone away that can 
a truly sick patient not end up in the emergency room. But anyway, uh, uh, for, for you, ma'am, uh, how do you get paid? I, I understand uh, San Francisco, I mean, he ends up in UCSF. I heard enough from my friends at UCSF how many people they have to deal with, and they're thrilled to have a sobering center. I'm sure it's the same at uh, County USC or any other county hospital in LA. So how do, but how do these centers get paid? The vast majority of programs are actually paid through county funds, and so the and so it's Department of Public Health is it's a county-funded organization, but it's around a million dollars a year covers everything, including the nursing staff, which is the vast majority of the cost. Uh, different programs are a little bit different. Santa Barbara is split between the county and the police department. They pay for it because it's aimed at the criminal justice system. Rhode Island, actually, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, opened up their program to go, and they are actually taking directly from EMS and the ambulance system currently. They are a Medi-Cal waiver program, and they can bill Medi-Cal for the visits that come in. And so there is an opportunity. I know Whole Person Care has funded three of the programs that are opening up in California right now. And there's not necessarily billing going on, but it's paid, by, paid for by county funds. Well, thank you. Questions for Dr. Bernadine or uh, Dr. Kazan? Dr. Levine. Just, um, just curious, your assessment of, for, there aren't that many of these centers in California, and I'm wondering what, what your sense is of the, um, the capacity compared to the size of the, demand, the denominator. That's an excellent question, because, so, there, we have small beds in most of the programs. A couple of efforts have gone, Houston opened up a program, it's 88 beds. Uh, Los Angeles has 55 beds in their sobering center. Uh, none of those programs fill to capacity at any point. So even two, but they can get up to like say 40 patients at one time. The, I think the most important is, is to have them strategically placed. Ideally you have one for cost because then you have one 24 hour staff, you don't have to pay for more. But trying to keep the sobering centers near one where the intoxicated persons typically are. So if it's a party scene, if you're at I'm going to use LA for Monica. There's a lot of intoxication going down that end. Uh, Hollywood. Uh, if you can keep them nearby, that helps out with the capacity issue. The second thing is being able to co-locate them other pr other programs. So some, if the target audience is homeless individuals. Now in San Francisco, of the unduplicated patients who come in the door, 30% are housed individuals. Like these aren't homeless folks. The people come in one time. 30% housed individuals out the company holiday party. Uh, Christmas holiday time is really popular in San Francisco for the sobering center. Um, and so it's a, we can take care of those individuals too, same as the regular individuals with chronic alcohol use disorders. It kind of depends on that particular population. And Oregon has one that's extremely busy on Friday, Saturday nights because they go for the party goers. Uh, it just kind of depends on that. Dr. Cross. While we worry about people who may be undiagnosed and suffer an adverse consequence, it's impressive to note that 95 to 96 percent arrivals leave successfully without needing to go to an emergency department. Has there been any outcomes analysis of those who have gone to the emergency department in terms of uh, what uh, their outcomes have been there? So the vast majority, and the problem is, is we haven't been able to do a four, like getting all the hospital records. And we have 10 hospitals using San Francisco, for example, 10 hospitals, so they don't always go to San Francisco General. Um, the both sobering centers of importance in Los Angeles and San Francisco, because they're county funded, and this is where the nice thing of being associated and designated by the county, is we have full access to all county medical records. So I can look up any client that comes to the sobering center, they can look at it's in LA County and Los Angeles, respectively, depending where they're at. Um, we have looked at some people, I know of negative outcomes in terms of people who were found in the street. In the 10 years in San Francisco, we had two undiagnosed head traumas come in the door. One we managed to identify within 45 minutes of being in the sobering center. The second one was an hour and a half. And because basically the staff are recognizing what intoxication looks like and what sobering looks like, that they could tell immediately that something was wrong with these individuals and this was not their standard of sobering up. Um, we could use that study, I would love it. I've been like a one woman show on lots of things when it comes to some of the research going on. And, uh, but we are, uh, we're gonna put out a new survey to no multiple, so hopefully in a month as soon as my IRB comes through. And then we are working on doing individual analysis for the ones who get kicked back to the unit. Yeah, the obvious benefit of doing the outcomes analysis is if you demonstrate there were one, two, three adverse outcomes that possibly were because of delay in transport you're then demonstrating a hugely successful program and you're putting to rest a lot of the concerns about 
the what ifs. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the what ifs aren't of significance. Yeah, with the with the EMSA pilot, because we are part of the pilot now with the state that started last January, all of those encounters that go back to the emergency department, we're doing a full top to bottom. Um, I'm actually trying to remember if we've had a single person get admitted to the hospital in that pilot. Everyone went to the emergency department, was treated and discharged at that Great. point. Thank you. you Any understand? other questions? If I can make one more comment. So as a former ED director, I can also say we had more than two, at least there were some people that didn't, um, sober as we expected them to. Sure. The other thing that I would say is this: the current status quo for the mental health urgent cares is um, the triage is happening by police officers who are trying to decide whether they really need to bring their patient to the emergency department where they may have to sit with them for a long time or transport them to the mental health urgent care. I was at least folks that are medically trained uh, and will receive additional training on top of it to be able to make that decision. I think it's far better. One last question from me. And are, 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 these center, are all of these centers county or, or some uh, private for-profit centers? Great question. All, none of them are um, private for-profit, county designated uh, or contracted with the county with a nonprofit. Thank you. Ms. Pines. Has there been anyone that's died in, in the sobering centers? In San Francisco, we've had 50,000 total encounters. We've had three people die. Um, in that 50,000, um, there was one gentleman who passed into a stay in his sleep. It was determined to be natural causes. There was no other, the no, med no internal bleeds, no heart attack. Um, there was another gentleman, the most recent was three years ago. He was five and a half hours into a stay. He was getting up, going back and forth to the bathroom a lot. He was chatting with the nurse. The nurse was trying to convince him to take a shower, and he's like, I'm going to him, and he was no cocaine in the bathroom. It was found about five minutes later. Uh, and then one woman who did come in very early on, and she was determined to have a respiratory condition. This was about seven years ago. And um, it, was, it was a bad call by the, it was a police department call who brought her in, it wasn't a paramedic. And it was something that was too late at that point. We had 911 activated and they worked on her. We did have someone actually code on a New Year's Eve with anxiety. There was a gentleman who came in and had a massive panic attack and actually coded. And the, uh, the staff were able to, the, the AED and everything, revive him while 911 was on its way. So that we've had some great success stories coming out of it in San Francisco. No deaths in Los Angeles at this point and very few across the country. And then one last question. If a person is en route to a sobering center and they don't want to go to the sobering center, can they then go to the hospital? They'll go right to the ED. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes they'll come in the door and be like, I don't want to be here now. They, you, they know the staff very well. And they'll be like, oh, so-and-so is working tonight. I'd rather go to the ED. And you're like, oh, okay, because they know they won't have peanut butter. Okay. Dr. Bollock. Sorry, Dr. Kazan. Now, I just want to say I think this is a terrific program. Uh, I think I, having worked in the county of Los Angeles, I do know our processes were very strict. I like the idea that it's going to be paramedics as opposed to sometimes when someone was called or an innocent bystander, they'd see somebody and they'd call the police and that person would be taken sometimes in handcuffs uh, somewhere and took a long time. Um, and in, in admitting patients to hospital, I do know exactly what happens to those folks. Our rule out sepsis and our all our traumas and everything else go first. It's a quick eyeball. So I think it's a it's a really important move. I would say that it uh, the other piece to this is to make sure, and I hope that that may be part of that. There is there are people there to try to connect these folks. Some people. It's hard for them to ever want to go back into society, but if there's somebody there that can help them, I think that's an important part of your model. Any comments from the audience? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Thank you for the presentation. My question is, what is the training that happens with law enforcement and other first responders as far as um, making them aware of these options? Sure. So as of now, because we haven't gotten authorization to do this, the answer is core curriculum of paramedic training and EMT training. The current proposal in the Gibson bill would add on 32 hours of training, uh, which may not sound like a lot, but is a very, actually a very heavy lift, particularly for a large department like ours. Um, so, but uh, that is our intention if, if this goes forward is to train our folks the 32 hours. Um, 
I'm not, I, I don't know the numbers for law enforcement. Um, I have heard the number 32 hours as well, but I, I, I can't verify it. Any comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? Angela, are there any no comments? comments? Thank you, uh, Dr. Bernadine, Dr. Kazan, thank you. And I, if the program works well, I think it's God sent because we, as a well, person who worked the entire life at Confields Life, but you got to make sure that people with health problems are not in these places. They should be in the emergency room, that's where they belong. And the second thing I suggest is put something together where actually their further care, whether it is a uh, mental health, those things are also taken into account rather than four to six hours they're out of there and they're coming back again uh, day after tomorrow. So it just, it just becomes like our uh, uh, Department of Mental, uh, the, our mental Health uh, Hospital and the next to the uh, real hospital where the street, jail, hospital, street, jail. I mean, it just makes no sense. Right. And there is some level with the clients. This is the life they're going to live for a while. In San Francisco, um, the San Francisco Sobering Center is the top referring party and transfer into detox in the city. And, um, for all the emergency departments, the list is now, even having only been open a year, is becoming a top refer into the detox facilities. So we do we work, and I and can just say, the staff who work at a sobering center are really, really dedicated to the clients. They're there because they want to be there, not because they're put there. Um, and our main concern is the individual. Uh, at Thank you Thank both. You. Okay, now, mm, now we are jumping into big one. <laughs> Moving into item 10, uh, discussion on possible action on 2018 legislation and regulations, Ms. Samos. Right. Okay, so please refer to your legislative packets and their tracker list. Um, on your tracker list, the bills in blue are either two-year bills or bills we've already taken positions on, so we'll, we will not be discussing these bills. The bill in pink is the board sponsor bill. We'll go over that bill first. And the bills in green will require a discussion and a position. I do want to report that recently died, AB 2409. SB 1240 and SB 1426, so we will not be going over these bills. Sure, it's um, AB 2409, SB 1240, and SB 1426. They died right before um, this meeting, so. So first I just wanted to provide an update on the board sponsored bill, AB 2311, Arambula, and this is the bill that the board is co-sponsoring with the UC Office of the President. This is a bill that would remove the pilot program status and existing law for the University of California, Los Angeles International Medical Graduate Program. And this allows the trainees to do activities. This bill passed out of Assembly BMP on consent, it passed out of appropriations on consent, and I just got word today that it passed off the assembly floor on consent. So it's moving along and it's having no opposition. <laughs> so um, moving on to the first bill in green, that's AB 710 Wood. And um, we actually, this, mirrors a bill from last year, AB 845, and, and the board actually took a neutral position on that bill, so I'm just going to give a quick summary. This is the bill that would ensure that if the federal government approves cannabidiol treatment, then it can be prescribed, furnished, and dispensed in California in accordance with federal law. So this bill really just aligns state law with federal law to allow it to be authorized by the federal government in the future. So board staff is suggesting that we again take a neutral position on this bill. Okay, do we have a second? second? Any comments from the board? Comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? Comments on the phone? <coughs> Angela, are there any comments on the phone? No, we have no questions. Thank you. Sounds like it's going through India or something. It is taking so long to, to get answer. Uh, please. Dr. Bola? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Dr. Krause? Ms. Lawson? Abstain. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton-Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. 
Motion passes. Go ahead. Okay, so the next bill is AB 1752. This is a bill that would add Schedule 5 drugs to the CURES database and would shorten the timeline for pharmacists to report dispense prescriptions. The board at our last meeting did take a supportive amended position because it had a concern with a provision that would have allowed the California State Board of Pharmacy to add CURES. This bill was, re was amended to remove that provision, so we don't need to take a position that was removed, so now we're in support. So I just wanted to update you on that. Okay, the next bill, AB 1791 Waldron. This bill would allow for an optional continuing medical education course in integrating HIV AIDS, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and post-exposure prophylaxis and counseling in primary care settings. This bill only requires the board to consider a course um, on these issues. Um, the board does not track employment information for physicians, so we wouldn't know which ones we're practicing in primary care settings. However, the board decides that it is important to get information out to physicians on this particular type of CME. It could include an information on the board's website. So board staff is suggesting the board take a neutral position on this bill. Okay, uh, any comment? That's a good thing? Yeah. Okay. It's just neutral. Move. It basically says that we're not supporting it, we're not opposing it, but right. we just don't have concerns. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we have uh, we have one point to take any mandated <laughs> CME. Yeah, that's right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, no, this, this is not a mandate. Yeah, this so is on these non, there's been quite a few of these bills that don't mandate um, CME, but just kind of bring the attention to light. So in the past, we've always been neutral on those bills. Yeah, which would be here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got burned once. We don't want to burn, burn multiple times, but the mandated pain made the OPI do epidemic worse. Okay, roll, uh, any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public and the audience? Yes, ma'am, come on in. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any comments on the phone? Uh, are there any comments on the phone? No comment. Thank you. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat, aye. Yeah. Dr. Hawkins? Abstain. Do Dr. Krauss? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, the next bill, AB 1795 Gibson. This is the bill that was kind of the topic of discussion in our last presentation. So it's the bill that will allow an EMT paramedic at the scene of an emergency to transport the patient to a behavioral health facility, sobering center, or a general acute care hospital. Emergency Medical Services Authority approved a local emergency medical services plan. So if you might remember at the last meeting, the board took a support and concept position on the previous language of this bill. Um, and, and on the AB 820. At that time, the board believed that language needed to be included that set specific criteria for EMS plans that must be approved. The board allowed the scope of EMTs to include all types of treatment. Um, this bill was amended, and it no longer includes any changes to an EMTP scope regarding treatment. That provision was taken out. This bill has, has added a significant amount of criteria that EMS plans must include. I'm not going to go over all the criteria. There are set criteria. It starts on page two of the analysis. Triage criteria and assessment procedures, and they all have to be approved by IMSA, which is the state um, agency responsible for this. IMSA would be required to adopt guidelines for the tri triage criteria criteria for the EMS agencies to use when they submit their plans. This bill also has definitions for the facility, so it defines behavioral health facilities and sobering in one of your analysis. And um, as the speakers in front of me said, it does actually include specified training that must be completed, and that's on page three of your analysis. This bill also requires IMSA to report specified information, including patient outcomes and recommendations for improvement, and to make these reports available to the public. In addition, the author accepted the amendment on Tuesday, so this bill was up in, um, in, for hearing on Tuesday, but they aren't in print yet, but I'll just let you know what the amendments are. They will clarify that there must be an RN at a sobering center at all times. They'll require if a patient is transported to a behavioral health facility or sobering center and is found upon assessment that the patient no longer meets the criteria for admission, then the patient must be immediately transferred to the hospital. And lastly, they will clarify that sobering centers are required to be city and or county run clinics. So with these changes, and based on the board's previous position, board staff is suggesting that board now take a support position on this bill. Uh, Dr. Levine. Is there anything in the bill about funding? There isn't anything in the bill. It's not really addressing the funding. It's more addressing um, what, what emergency medical services authority has to approve, and it's basically adding these to a provision that all EMS have to submit their plans to EMSA for approval, and it's allowing them to now include this as part of their plan. So no, funding isn't addressed. So it's in when there is a sober. So it has to 
be, it has to be county run, basically. So that's what they're, and then for, um, for the definition of a behavioral health facility, I believe that it's um, is designated in the welfare institutions code as meeting one of those definitions that's already in existence. Thanks. Jennifer, as I recall, uh, it was supported by California Health Post by the ER physician. So where is it? Right. Uh, so it's <laughs> it's kind of at the same place. So this is supported by the county of Los. It's the sponsor by the county of Los Angeles and the um, California Hospital Association. They submitted support letters today um, on the, while I was on the plane to to you to, asking you to support. And also the assembly member Gibson's office also sent us a letter urging us. Um, I think that we've come a long way. I think. Um, the emergency physicians are still aren't and aren't supporting this bill. CMA also um, testified in opposition. Um, they bring up the point that the pilot programs um, include a specific criteria that this, these plans to include. IMSA still has to approve the plans, and they still have to set guidelines. IMSA is the one that ran the pilot programs. Um, there is another bill that we'll go over later that. Um, is expanded on this, but it basically requires the guidelines to be based on those pilot programs, and people seem to be have a, a, a more positive outlook on that bill, although there's nothing registered and support. Um, but yes, their, their stance is the same. I think it's I think it's come a long way because it's actually requiring certain criteria to be in the bill. It's requiring IMSA to do guidelines, and it's setting all that in law. Um, we, we can talk about the other bill later, but. Um, to me, it's a raise, so I guess it's up to the board to decide if it's actually done that. From a staff standpoint, looking at what we said there needs to be criteria, now there's criteria set to require it to have triage criteria. IMSA is required to do guidelines. The um, plan that, must, that they have to submit have to meet those guidelines that IMSA um, has to adopt. So um, actually the triage criteria put in statute because that would not make sense, so. Okay, any questions? Okay, any comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? Oh, I need to take a motion. I move to Take it again. I move to support okay. this bill. Do we have second. a second? Second. Okay. So we got, so any comments on the phone? No comments. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Oops. Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gondev? Aye. The motion carries. Okay. This bill is AB 1998 Rodriguez. This bill would require by June 1st, 2019, every healthcare practitioner <coughs> authorized to prescribe opioids to adopt a safe prescribing protocol. This bill would allow a group of practitioners to adopt a protocol that applies to all parties as part of a business affiliation or contract with an organized provider group. The protocol to be a written document promoting the appropriate and optimal selection, dosage, and duration of opioid prescriptions for patients with the goal of reducing the misuse, the misuse of opioids and the actual requirements for that protocol are specified on page two of the analysis. This bill would allow a health care practitioner or a group of practitioners for Medicare and Medicaid service opioid prescribing guidelines as their protocol. This bill would specify that in the, if, if in the healthcare practitioner's professional judgment, adherence to the safe prescribing protocol is not appropriate for a patient's condition, the practitioner must note in the patient's record the reason the protocol was not followed. This bill would specify that it does not apply prescribing opioids is limited to patients undergoing treatment for chronic pain, cancer, substance use disorder, or hospice or end of life care. This bill would state that failure to develop or adhere to the protocol would constitute unprofessional conduct, which would be enforceable by the Healthcare Practitioners Licensing Board, which would be us in the case of physicians. This bill would require public health, utilizing data from the CURES database for the year ending December 31st, 2016, to monitor progress toward the goals stated in the legislative intent, which is basically just to reduce um, opioid misuse. And this bill would require CD, or Department of Public Health to report this information to the legislature on an annual basis. The pandemic remains a matter of concern for the board. This bill would require individual physicians or physician groups to develop protocols, but instead of each individual physician or group developing a new protocol, this bill would allow adoption of the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services opioid prescribing guidelines. 
This bill does not mandate the standard care and law, but it does require prescribing opioids, which may help to promote appropriate prescribing. Board staff suggested the board take a neutral position on this bill. The reason for the, sorry, the reason for the neutral versus support on something like this? Right, so um, I was trying to, neutral was basically middle of the work how all the physicians would feel about this. At one hand, it is a good idea, but re but requiring every physician to adopt a prescribing protocol could be time intensive, having to write into their their um, patient records every time that protocol is not followed. So um, I, d I definitely think we don't want to oppose this bill, but um, you know, I decide to support it. Okay. Dr. Hawkins. So I wonder about the education of all the physicians for the prescribing protocol. But I understand why hospice would be excluded, but I don't know why, if I heard you correctly, why chronic pain would be excluded because that's one of the largest groups where there's a concern about abuse. Okay. Well, I think it would more reach the acute, um, acute pain population, not necessarily the chronic pain. Well, usually uh, acute pain population is the least susceptible to opioids if you uh, give small amounts. I mean, every post-op patient gets acute pain. I mean, that's... It doesn't even make sense. So well, so before the three days, and so they took that language out, and that was meant to just not go to acute pain, but it was meant, or to acute pain, not chronic pain. So if you had something and you saw an emergency room, you were they were limiting that to three days. So the language changed not the long, that long ago to now be a safe prescribing protocol instead of a limit on opioids. The intent for this bill truly was the acute pain individuals who are going in and getting, you know. A 30 or 90 day supply and so that's really why the this bill went and I d think that they probably thought that you know the three-day limit wasn't gonna go through so they were trying to look at something to get to those those entities where they think the problem is occurring yeah I mean three day will be g great for post-op uh, hernia surgery it's not great for somebody with back surgery I mean there are so many things there how do you even come up with so I, I which think is probably you, why you, they changed what? language <laughs> No, 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 I, I get that. And then chronic pain is, a, I think it might need a lot more cooking before we do. Maybe that's the reason you were recommending neutral. That's, I'm just thinking what you want. The reason talking. is basically what I said, that, you know, it, it could possibly promote um, appropriate or safer, pr appropriate prescribing. But um, I didn't know if we wanted to go all the way to support it. So that's why I suggested it. Dr. Levine. I one reason to stay neutral. I, I think there are a lot of problems with this approach. and. Part and and the, one of the the biggest problem is how do you if you're going to write a piece of legislation you need to be able to actually assure that the that whatever you legislated was in, requiring every physician in the state with a DEA license right. to adopt a protocol. It's pretty easy for medical staffs and 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 medical groups and um, to do that. I think. I, I sure wouldn't oppose it because there's a lot of good things in here. I would agree that, that um, this bill needs a lot of work. And in particular, the biggest problem is chronic, the use of chronic opioids beyond 90 days for, quotes, chronic pain, particularly musculoskeletal pain. So this solves a piece of the problem. It's, it's not a perfect bill, and I think that it would be a very difficult bill to implement um, or to de demonstrate that it's had an impact, but I, uh, though I do think that the ability to to report on um, whether or not over the you know I think we've already seen quite honestly a decrease in the prescribing of opioids. A valuable piece of this is the ability um, f to report to the public and the legislature on an annual basis the, the extent to which opioid use not just misuse, but opioid use is decreasing in the state is an important thing. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Dr. Lewis. This bill to me seems very prescriptive for physicians. It's almost mandating what you have to do without any independence. And um, we have programs in place to educate physicians in the public, and we need to let them work. And if this, well, we already have things out there that we're trying to do that. I would definitely put an oppose and leave the oppose in there. I don't know if you can amend this because they've already worked on it, right? I mean, there, 
all the bills are being worked on now. We're just at the beginning of so, really the working session, so that's why it's a bad word because they're like at the beginning of the well, working out process. But we, I, I would just recommend uh, an opposed unless amended, and that means you can still work on it. So with an opposed unless amended, we will need to know what amendments the boards mm -hmm. would, board would like to see in them then. New, new, with neutral, we can kind of stay at the table but not have I think this bill is like at the beginning of the working out process. They've already actually taken pretty big amendments to take out the three-day limit and instead put the safe prescribing protocol. I mean, it's up to you. I mean, if you want specific amendments, opposed and less amended is a little more um, strong on um, we kind of oppose the idea, but here's obviously positive, and then neutral is just um, kind of neither one nor the other, but it still kind of gives us at the table with a position. I mean, it's up to the board how you want. I mean, I think with the board's um, participation and um, work on helping to prevent inappropriate prescribing, I mean, there are some good things and then too negative, but it is up to the board what they want to do. Go ahead, Dr. Bola. So I, I do like this bill in many ways. I think the three day was a bit much and I see that that was raised that we want to look at that. I don't have a problem necessarily with not of having people describe why they're going to be prescribing opioids, what alternatives exist, and how long I'm going to prescribe them. So don't come back to me in a you know month and expect your prescription for opioids. So again, I would just defer to my colleagues and say, you know, I um, I just would register. Uh, a, uh, a, I would go with a neutral uh, if amend, and I think the amendments. I agree with Dr. Levine. It, it's a, it's not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. The bill. Is the consensus is neutral. So can we have a motion to uh, I have? change my mo? Do I change? You my didn't motion? make a motion yet. Oh, so I'm moved. so moved to uh, p uh, m remain neutral. Okay, so we have a second from uh, Mr. Second. Roma? Yeah. Okay, any other comments from the board? The public? Mr. Andrist. I'm always astonished when I hear one of the reasons to not check the CURES database is so that doctors don't have to take the time to check the CURES database. People are dying every single disciplinary document that comes out of the medical board now, every single one. And the majority of them are prescribing issues. We can't worry about doctors having to take time to check cures. That can never be a reason. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. I, I don't think that was an issue, but thank you, though. Uh, comments? Comments on the phone? No comments. Thank you. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. The motion carries. Next one. Okay, next bill, AB 2086. This bill would allow a prescriber to access the CURES database for a list of patients for whom that prescriber is listed as a person. This is very important tool and effective aid for physicians to use to prevent doctor shopping. This bill will give physicians access to more information and cures, which will make it even a more effective for, for physicians. So board staff is suggesting that board take a support position on this bill. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's only for the physicians and their staff, I gather, right? No, they can't. They can't a report to say um, what physicians list me as a prescriber. So that's basically what this bill would do. Okay. Any, Dr. Yip. The language he says uh, for a list of patients for whom they are listed as being the prescriber. Right. I think the system should work that and get on the site once a week, once a month, just check under my name or his name who are the patients that receive opioid prescription. That's how we can check if someone is misusing it. I'm not sure about a list of patients, what it means. 
means I have to pick a list of patients. Maybe pay, maybe there's someone using the prescription, you know? Yeah, that's the, I think that's exactly what it's for, is so physicians know who's listing them as their prescriber, and the whole point of this is to make sure that patients aren't listing them when they're actually not their physician. So it, am it, I missing anything? It's literally for you to be able right. to run your own prescribing. This has been something DOJ has pushed back and said that you don't have the ability because it's not in law. It authorizes you to run your patient and so this has been something that physicians have wanted and quite frankly with diversion of drugs and diversion of prescription pads this will help physicians okay second <coughs> any other questions from the board or comments public comment comments on no comment okay roll call please dr bolat hi dr hawkins yes dr kraus yes ms lawson Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. <coughs> Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Gonadab? Aye. The motion carries. Next one, Jim. Okay, next bill, AB 2138. This bill would prohibit denial or revocation and suspension of a license for specified convictions. This bill would prohibit regulatory boards from requiring an applicant to self disclose criminal history information. This bill would require boards to collect and publish applicants who are denied licensure who have licenses revoked or suspended for this conviction information. This bill would significantly narrow the authority of the board to deny a license and take disciplinary action for criminal convictions and actions taken by other licensing boards, even for crimes involving sexual misconduct, fraud, and alcohol or substance abuse, to automatically deny a license on the basis of the acts underlying a conviction. This bill would define denial to also include probationary licenses. This bill would allow applicants to lie on their application and not be met with any consequences as the board would no longer be able to issue a probationary license based on the applicant not disclosing information. This bill would limit the for a probationary license to two years, which is less than the board typically imposes for in unprofessional conduct. This bill would allow a licensee whose license has been placed on probation to petition the board for a change to that probation, including modification or termination of probation one year from the effective date of the decision. And this bill would require the board to issue its decision 90 days of submission of the petition. This bill is unnecessary because the board already complies with the Administrative Procedures Act. Applicants and licensees have the right to have their matters heard through the administrative process and then to appeal to a superior court if they disagree with this board's, the board's decisions. This bill would result in significant fiscal impact to the board over a reporting requirement and the time frames to process petitions for termination, modification, or probation. This bill will significantly narrow the board's ability to deny, license, deny licenses, issue probationary licenses, and take disciplinary actions for convictions. This bill is not in line with the board's mission of consumer protection, and board staff suggest that the board take an opposed position on this. Why are you never more convincing than this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just Carry curious home, yeah. <laughs> how far this bill went. Uh, just just uh, curiosity. Okay, any comments from the board? Comments from the audience? Comments on the floor? Okay, can we have a motion to? Motion to oppose the Okay. Yeah, Okay, Ron, we need to get you glasses. No, you got one. <laughs> uh, so, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Krause. Aye. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. The motion carries to oppose. Okay. Okay, okay AB 2174, language that was included in AB 182 from last year, which the board supported. This is the bill that requires CDPH. Um, Upon appropriation by the legislature, a receipt of adequate state or federal funding to develop, coordinate, implement, and oversee a comprehensive multicultural public awareness campaign to be known as a heroin and opioid public education program to combat crack in California. Um, we supported this bill last year. St staff is suggesting that we again take a support position. Sure. Yeah. It just says neutral on our chart. Right. Oh, sorry. It's it's support. Yeah, sorry. I pro I apologize for yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, Jennifer. Why was neutral? Okay. No, I made a mistake. <laughs> okay. Can can we have a motion? Is to support. Support. To support AB twenty one seventy four. Correct. 
second do we have second okay any comments from the board comments from the audience comments on the phone no comments thank you roll call please dr bolat aye dr hawkins yes dr kraus yes ms lawson aye dr levine aye dr lewis aye ms pines aye mr warmuth aye dr yip yes dr ganadev aye the motion carries next one please okay next bill ab 2193 this bill would require any health care practitioner that treats or attends to a mother or child or both to screen the mother for maternal mental health conditions at least once during pregnancy and once during the practitioner receives confirmation from a treating psychiatrist that the mother will remain under the psychiatrist care during pregnancy in the postpartum period this bill would require any facility where a health care practitioner treats or attends to the mother child or both in the first post delivery appointment to ensure that the healthcare practitioner conducts the screening and reports the findings. This bill would require by July 1st, 2019 to develop a case management program that is available for an enrollee and his or her treating provider when the provider determines an enrollee may have a mater maternal mental health condition. This bill would require a healthcare service plan contract and a health insurance policy on or after January 1st, 2019 to provide coverage for maternal mental health condition required by this bill. This bill would set the standard of care and statute. The practice of medicine is ever evolving and is not appropriate to statutorily mandate the standard of care. This bill does not allow for changes in practice consistent with the evolution of medicine and historically the board has opposed any bill that sets the standard of care and practice so staff is suggesting the board oppose this bill. We'll take some comments. Question. Yes, Dr. Hawkins. So is the primary uh, goal to protect an infant or child? Um, no, mother. It's uh, really um, for the mother and postpartum care. So basically what it's requiring is uh, screenings at certain points of time by that practitioner or um, of the mother. practitioner or unless they're under the care of her. Yeah. So that any, including like an ophthalmologist who sees for an eye problem? No. Any health care practitioner that it treats or attends to a mother or child or both. It's, it's, to screen the mother for a maternal at least once during pregnancy and once during postpartum. So, I mean, not really looking at like general mental health care, I'm not saying that that's bad at all, but kind of historically when you've ever set the standard in law like this, like for this, you do this, that's kind of putting the pr practice of medicine in statute and we usually try to avoid that. It's not necessarily the subject matter that I think that we're su I'm suggesting a post position on, it's more of setting that standard of care in the practice of medicine and when screening for this, if anyone sees them during this time, it's kind of setting that in actual law, which in the past has been not necessarily a good thing because things change with medicine and then you have to go and get a law change, so. Can I make a motion? Yeah, I, now I wanna see if I, I truly understand this. It's that any practitioner, optometrist, ophthalmologist, whatever, that would be seeing this patient, they have to do screening? It's actually, the, the wording in the language says, it shall be the duty of any healthcare practitioner who treats or attends a mother or child or both to screen the mother for maternal mental health conditions at least once, once during the postpartum period. The only exception is if they're being treated by a psychiatrist. So it doesn't say their OBGYN has to treat them. It's any, the way that it reads um, right now is any healthcare practitioner. And so this would be analogous to setting uh, guidelines that, to your point, right. uh, diabetes guidelines don't apply to diabetes now. I do think the bill has merit in the sense that screening for maternal uh, mental health issues is important and hopefully that ACOG will, you know, and has published these guidelines, which is are important. I'm yeah, I mean, I wanted to make it clear, it's not the subject matter, it's just it's in, in statute where you have to go change law if, if something were to change. Um, no. Um, I, I agree with that. I, I think the concept is absolutely right, and I think many, if not most, OBGYNs do a mental health screen of mothers, both prepartum and uh, um, But this is way beyond that. Um, okay, you, I move to oppose AB 2193. Hi, Carrie Sparrow, I'm licensed midwife. Um, I think the in 
the way that I read this, the intent is for the health care provider that's caring for the pregnant woman for the pregnancy, and maybe they need to clarify. But I can tell you in practice, um, women aren't getting screened. And one in five women is going to have a mental health problem, primarily um, perinatal um, depression. And sometimes it's fatal. And if we're, not, if we're not getting providers to do it on their own, which I've, I've worked for many, and created actually um, pre and perinatal guidelines for evaluating women for um, depression and perinatal mood disorder, screening pool. It's not a big deal, and it's not going to, this law doesn't prescribe exactly even how you have to screen them. So it's just saying you need to look at this, guys, because you're not. I mean, women are dying because this isn't being attended to. And uh, I would at least go neutral on it and see how they amend it down the road. It's not, it's, we do require things to protect the public of physicians. We require physicians to look at Cures database, for instance. Um, so that they're not over prescribing opioids to say you know you you need to protect the health of these women and um, up your game a little bit and and protect these mothers Thank you. Any other comments? is there a mandate uh, what to do after you screen um, yeah. that's one of my concerns that's very care physician you have to report the findings of the screen to the primary care physician if the screener is not the primary care physician. For many women, they, the, the OBGYN is their primary care physician, and it does not say anything about what they do with the information. Comments on the phone. Are there any comments on the phone? Guess not. Angela, are there any comments on the phone? No comment. Thank you. I, I understand the concept is on a bad microphone. I understand uh, the bill is bad. So we got a motion made and seconded. So can we have a roll call, please? I just have another question before the, we're there. Is, is the reading of this that it's the health care practitioner who attends the mother or child or both in the first post delivery appointment? Or so is it, isn't it restricted? Are we doing that wrong? Okay. Yeah, it, in the, it's what I read before. Basically, what it starts out, it doesn't specify that it just it's the duty of any healthcare practitioner treats or attends a mother or child or both. Okay, so treats so it or attends. Be the pediatrician who sees. That's an or, so it's not. Okay, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat. Abstain. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Kraus. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? No. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Epstein. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Sounds like motion carries. Is that correct? No, and one upstate, I gather. Eight, we have. Okay, thank you. Next. Okay, so we're, we're, I said at the beginning we're skipping the next one, which is 2409, because it ended up dying. So um, the next bill, AB 2461, would require the Department of Justice to provide all subsequent state and federal criminal history to any state or federal law to receive this information for any person whose fingerprints are maintained on file at DOJ or the FBI. The board depends on DOJ notifications to be informed that a licensee has been arrested or convicted of a crime. This is very important information for the board to receive so it can look into the matter and take appropriate action. The board currently receives subsequent reports to the Department of Justice. However, the board does not receive subsequent arrest information from the FBI. So requiring um, Department of Justice to provide information from the FBI is essential for the board to meet its mission of consumer protection. So the board staff is suggesting we take a support position. Okay, any comments? Do we have a motion and a second? Okay. Any comments again from the board? Comments from the public? 
Comments on the phone? No comment. Thank you. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Aye. Dr. Levine. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Pines. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Dr. Yip. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. The motion carries. Next. Okay, AB 2483 would be to teach a pay for a judgment or settlement for tribal damage antitrust awards against a member of a regulatory board for an act or omission occurring within the scope of his or her official capacity as a member of a regulatory board. This bill would also specify that the tribal damages awarded are not punitive or exemplary damages. This protection is needed for board members serving on regular state will identify board members against personal liability for reasonable good faith actions taken as part of their role as board members or, su or serve on a board. Board staff suggests that the board take a support position on this bill. Thank you, Jennifer. Any, Kim? I just wanted to say this is really the outcome of the North Carolina issue and the issue for board members with the issue. Yeah, well, spent some time with the DCA on this one, I recall. Okay, can we have a motion to approve? Okay, any comments from the board? Comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? No comment. Dr. Bolton. Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Ms. Pines. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. The motion carries. Okay, AB 2487 would require all licensed physicians to complete a mandatory continuing medical education course on the treatment and management of opiate dependent patients. This course must include eight hours of training in buprenorphine treatment of opioid use disorders. Buprenorphine are exempt from this requirement. This bill re would require the board to determine whether the physician has met the requirements of this bill. Um, the board adopted a policy compendium in 2014, which the board opposed the concept of mandated continuing medical education topics. Um, the compendium states that the board believes each licensed physician should decide which type of continuing practice. As such, board staff is suggesting the board take an opposed position on this bill. Okay, any comments from the board? Yes. Here. Dr. Hawkins, then. So Krause. this seems like an important enough one to actually uh, support. Only problem I have is why buprenorphine. I know it's an uh, opiate antagonist, so it sort of, um, competes with opioids. It seems to me this is a very, very important one to get folks closer to the standard. So, th so the re training that's required is basically the same training that physicians are required to take for SAMHSA to get the X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine, and not all physicians may be processed now for physicians to take this training if they want to apply to SAMHSA to get the X waiver and, and be able to prescribe buprenorphine. This um, bill would have originally required all licensee before you got a license to be eligible for licensure to take this training. I think one of their original thoughts was to require all physicians to get a waiver. This is kind of like a hybrid where instead of requiring, just requiring physicians to take the training that would be required for the waiver. So, you know, I basically oppose just based on what we've kind of done on mandated CME, not necessarily the topic, but um, there is a process now for a physician if they're interested in prescribing buprenorphine to take this extra training and um, qualify for um, to get the waiver under. Uh, training to prescribe that drug? This is that's compared the to training. training for opioid. Okay. Yeah. I this is basically the training that's required for to Dr. prescribe Cross. buprenorphine. Thank you, Jennifer. For those of us who are older who have not yet lost our cognitive ability, there is some irony in this bill because where the California State Legislature mandated 12 hours of pain education for every licensed physician. And this was in the same era where we developed pain as the fifth vital sign and the drug pushers were hiring experts to go around the country delivering lectures how to stamp out every bit of pain in order to prevent reflex sympathetic dystrophy and other chronic neuropathic diseases. And it was that act of our legislature and other legislatures around the country which fueled the opioid epidemic which the legislature is now endeavoring to correct. I don't think that the state legislature is the appropriate, appropriate continuing medical education needs are for physicians. I think that needs to derive from professional medical societies. I oppose. Thank you, Dr. Cross. 
Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Wills. I have a question. Is there any history here of a requirement that those physicians who would be prescribing physicians be required to take this versus physicians who would not be prescribing? Um, there's not a requirement. Now, this is, um, although it says opioid treatment and management, eight hours has to be in the buprenorphine treatment. So this is more um, focused on the buprenorphine portion of it. If you want to be able to prescribe buprenorphine, um, I mean, there is some on treatment and management, at least eight hours has to be on buprenorphine. So there's no requirement right now other than the, the pain management um, CME that's required of all physicians. That's but the only the, thing. The question was whether there was a discussion about narrowing the requirement to those physicians who would, those who prescribe opiates would then be required to have this continuing education? Um, there, there hasn't been, to my knowledge. When I met with the author's office, when they were like looking for ideas over the break, like I said, their first idea was to require everyone to get the waiver. So they kind of moved out from that idea and moved to the CME. So I don't think there's been discussion on just um, prescribing CME, not just focused on buprenorphine. That's kind of been the focus of this author's um, purpose of this bill. Mm -hmm. I can't. Dr. Bolak. Thank you for the explanation. I'm um, one of the things this is needed, the idea of, of having this, even this eight hours to get buprenorphine, I think can be a big barrier. There's a lot of people that uh, I would like to hear uh, maybe at a, another meeting um, about the buprenorphine in general. I think it's a, it, it works very well. I concur with my colleague. About that because what we're doing today with buprenorphine may change th two years from now so uh, that I understand but having the blockade of not being able to get doctors to be able to easily prescribe buprenorphine uh, if they were trained is important which again is not the subject matter of this bill it's thank you any other comments no comment. Ms. Lawson I think I'd like to offer maybe a different perspective because this we, we talk about opioid addiction at every single one of our meetings, at least every meeting I've attended, and the substantial majority of the disciplinary decisions relate to either overprescription, bad prescriptions, prescriptions to people who never should have received these things in the first place. And while, while I appreciate um, that, that, that physicians or, or better suited in some respects to um, deciding or determining or, or mandating the type of continuing medical education that's provided. There is an opioid crisis in this country currently, and I think as we have an obligation to try out different solutions. And to me, eight hours, I think it's eight hours of continuing medical education. Um, an opioid addiction is not a bad way to attempt to solve it. As attorneys, we're required, you know, whether or not you're a substance abuser or not, we have to take certain mandated training to get this crisis under control. And I, I appreciate that the crisis may have been legislatively created in some respects, um, but I think we need to um, try to support reasonable potential solutions, and I don't think eight hours of mandated training time over over the the court of that thing uh, <clears throat> miss lawson so uh jennifer explain this to me my understanding here is the training is for the opioid antidote is that correct to prescribe so what it requires is a mandatory cme course on the treatment and management of opioid dependent patients but that training must include treatment right so so you would meet that requirement if you just did their ba I mean, just knowing because I talked to the author's office, they're basing this on the CARA, the um, Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act of 2016, which has to do with the buprenorphine. So they want you at least to get that eight hours, and this is the same training that's required to get the SAMHSA X waiver. So there's some other bills that we'll talk about later that for just opioids in general, but this bill is really meant to focus on that buprenorphine um, section because although you could get more training in other um, areas on opioid treatment, eight hours of that has to be in buprenorphine. So that's kind of where they're focusing this. Like I said, when I started, when I started my conversations, um, at first they were kind of looking at medical schools and what everyone to get that, that X 
waiver, and then they kind of settled on just everyone taking the training for that buprenorphine waiver, but not necessarily having to get the waiver. So that's just in conversations. It's and not I, what the I, I am appreciative of that nuance. I don't think we should take an opposed position on these bills. If we want to be neutral and say go forth and you know continue to figure this out, but I, I and, and I recognize one perspective out of many is seems to me to be the wrong position on this 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 bigger picture issue. Yes, uh, Dr. Bola. Um, I, I want to just for myself make the, but I, my point was my opposition has to do with the linkage of buprenorphine. I would low away and that this buprenorphine is prescribed like warfarin, which is as dangerous if one wants to think of a drug that we use all the time. So uh, I that but I am I would say at this point for me I, I think this is still I think we all recognize the opioid the, the epidemic and just to clarify my post position wasn't based on the subject matter it was just based on our policy compendium of always taking opposed positions on mandated CME Dr. Lewis as a practicing physician uh, oh sorry it's all the way over here um, um, and maybe other colleagues of mine are usually opposed to being mandated certain types of CME, and we've always opposed that. If I'm a physician that I'm doing disability reviews only, and that's going to be the rest of my life, to be mandated that for morphine um, it doesn't seem to be f fair for people like me in my practice, I think if you're going to be in a pain management setting or out there, maybe in an ER, maybe maybe that's so. But to to have eight hours is going to be in buprenorphine, it does not do me any good, and I don't think that's the right way to go about solving the opioid problem just by having extra training in this one specific drug, which two years from now there may be the latest and greatest, and we won't be using it anymore. Dr. And Lewis, it may not be the, the, the precise approach that should be taken, but we grant licenses to physicians and surgeons to do anything. So, I mean, you could be doing that disability review currently, and 10 years from now, you could be doing neurosurgery. Surgery, I mean, I'm being dramatic. But, I mean, you could be doing something significantly different. And that you see, right? It's not necessarily that the, the people prescribing opioids are in pain management or even in the you know regular business of doing these things and they're prescribing hundreds and hundreds of these pills. Mr. Warmont, I see your point, uh, well taken. Uh, I'm a little lost here. This bill does not mandate training for prescribing opiates. It, it requires training for solving over prescriptions of opiates. Is that correct? So the mandatory CME has to be on, it's a course, on the treat, the course must include eight hours of training in buprenorphine. So it could be more than the eight hours, right? So someone could take, I don't know, 12 hours, and four of it would be on the um, opiate-dependent patients and treatment and management, but eight of those hours have to be in the buprenorphine. So it could be both, but for sure, the eight hours have to be on buprenorphine. So the one requirement of that CME has to be on is buprenorphine. So you could take more as a physician and still take that course and take more than the eight hours, but the one requirement is that eight hours. But the only mandate is at the other end to uh, solve the opiate problem. Or yeah. <laughs> to treat it, treat it right, exactly. treat yes. it, right. Not, it's not necessarily, in, it's on the treatment side, not the prevention so side. So I, I, I think that's what Dr. Bollard's point was, actually. She continuously made that point that you're ask, asking it should be available to all the physicians, rather give Narcan to anyone in school to inject. I mean, uh, because it's such an epidemic, and now we are making something else more difficult for a doctor to treat. So. Uh, plus, I think uh, mandating a CME is, has been an issue for this board. We took it up multiple times on that. So that's what my concern is. Available to any physician who wants to prescribe, and if that physician prescribes wrongly, he or she is on disciplinary problems. But it, it should not make it more difficult because many doctors walk away taking some mandated CME. Next thing you know is that uh, they're going through. 
everybody else. Okay, to, it's a tough uh, one. No, so. I, I have I have one other comment to Miss Lawson's point, where we as a board have not required the rigor that this is passing through, where uh, a board where a bill is passing, and so here where we have acknowledged literally in every meeting that there's this opioid crisis that we want to address it, it it seems that opposing this is 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 more uh, is more stringent they require any other bill but for our statement that we don't want to mandate MCLE and so uh, I think in terms of patient protection uh, neutral would be more appropriate to allow the working out of the kinks. Dr. Ross. I fear that we can't fix every problem with more CME. Uh, and the cases that we see of the bad doctors, if you will, who are over prescribing are a mixture of uh, greed and, and incompetence uh, in eight hours. Um, it's a crisis, it's a problem. Uh, but I don't think we should encourage our legislature to set standards of medical education. That's not going to solve anything. Okay, any other comments? We are somewhat stuck here. So, uh, motion, any motion you want to make? And uh, if it is seconded, we'll take it on. If it doesn't pass, we'll take uh, the other motion on. We'll follow the democratic uh, procedure. So, who can make a motion? Okay, we got a motion to make it neutral. Second. Do we have a second? So motion made and seconded to stay neutral on this. Uh, any comments from the board? Any further comments? I think I heard enough comments already. Uh, any comments from the audience? Uh, Mr. Andrist. Just a quick question to ponder. I'm, I'm with Ms. Sutton Wilson. Opposing CMA, ACME ever not in the interest of, or, or how is it ever in the interest of not doing patient safety? What does opposing CMA have to do with patient safety? It would seem that more CME would be better for patient safety. And your priority is to think about patient safety. Any other comment? I, I think it's important to understand that we want doctors in their offices taking care of patients, and we already require 50 hours of CME. What is that, every year or every two years for, for maintenance of licensure? Uh, and most physicians are selecting what education is, a, is appropriate for them. Uh, mandating CME to hundreds of thousands of doctors who are just going to spend eight hours out of the office to do it for conditions of licensure isn't appropriate if we don't have evidence that it's going to improve the Okay, any, any comments on the phone? No comments. Okay, we'll go to roll call and uh, as I said, my concern is not about the uh, mandate CME is one, but the biggest one is actually treat. That's what my worry is here. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat. Nay. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Abstain. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Dr. Levine. Dr. Lewis. Nay. Ms. Pines. Yes. Ms. Sutton Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. No. Dr. Yip. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Up. We have three no's, three abstains. One, two, three, four, five. Five yeses. Doesn't pass. Motion fails. Do we have any other motion? Uh, let me make sure, Kerry. You tell it me. It didn't pass. Yeah, that's but, what I thought. Um, Ms. Sutton Wills has a question. My question is whether we can make a motion to be briefed on this bill prior to taking a position. It, it's the timing of this. This is probably going to go before a hearing. Um, so 
that's that's the problem with we can't wait till the July meeting because by then it'll go through hearings. I mean, it, it'll progress as it's going to progress. It's just the medical board will not be able to put forward its position on the bill. Move opposed. Okay, so we have a motion to oppose. And this is opposing. Opposing. Oppose the bill. Again, we just voted. Oh, we voted. No, no, no. we voted to oppose neutral position. Okay, so I'm, I'll second his to oppose. Okay, I guess the bill I ever remember. <laughs> yeah, it has been. Okay, so let's go for Comment. a roll call, please. So. Motion to oppose, made and seconded. Roll call. Roll call. Dr. Bolat. Abstain. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Lawson. Dr. Levine. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Uh, yes. Ms. Pines. No. Ms. Sutton Wills. No. Mr. Warmoth. Dr. Yip. No. Dr. Gonadev. Abstain and it fails, I gather. <laughs> <laughs> so it will, we'll just leave it alone. <clears throat> All right, next. I will. I'm going to call, I'm going to call the staff. Remember that there are many other players in this one. They will work on it. And we, I mean, there are some good things, there are some bad things, so we, we got, uh, we, we took what we was the right position, so we're okay. Kim. I just think, I think one problem in this bill for, and I know the, our compendium about opposing CME mandated CMA, I think the, the, where we struggle, at least from staff's perspective on this bill, is that it's only on buprenorphine. If it was on um, you know, m even going back to, you know, require uh, how it is right now with um, the opioid crisis and CME, how it's changed because so many individuals took the CME back in, you know, when it, the, it was a very di different tenor. Um, so if it was something that would support something that was more up to date with how to appropriately prescribe, that's, I just wanted to let you know the issue with the neutral because, or the oppose at the time is because of it's just specific to buprenorphine, which not everybody's going to use, but individuals that prescribe need to know how to prescribe appropriately. So that's more of the issue. Okay. I, uh, just to comment, yeah. I, I think the, in, I mean, the only to dramatically increase the number of physicians who are available to treat opiate opiate-dependent opiate patients. The problem and the limit c today is the training that's required um, in order to do that, in order to treat it, other than the bureaucratic requirements that go along with it. So it's, it, it doesn't, I mean, that's, that's part of the challenge. The other thing is it, it doesn't even exempt people who don't have a DEA license, never write a prescription for a controlled substance. So it's it's essentially 130,000 licensees. But we've ever seen a problem solved by mandatory CME. And unfortunately, the X waiver is a federal requirement. That's. Okay, uh, Jennifer, before you go to the next one, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. We'll stop at item 10 today. It's going to wait for the item 11 through. Afterwards, we'll take him on tomorrow. So. Miss Alameda, that includes a lot of your items there. So I just want to, because we will be here way past 6.30 on item 10. Right, Jennifer? Even at Jennifer's speed, we'll be here. We're finishing 10. We're finishing 10. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's more opioid bills. <laughs> I'm sure we will do. we got yeah, no okay. choice. So next. The next one's the easy one. It's the same language that was in AB 148 from last year where the board took a neutral position. This is a bill that revises the definition of practice settings for community collectability under the position for loan repayment program, which includes a Stephen M. Thompson loan repayment program. So this changes it from 50% of their patient population qualifies as medically underserved to 30% if the setting, setting is in a rural area. Like I said, last, um, at the last, last year the board took a neutral position, so staff is suggesting we take the same position. Let me do it. 
to ask any questions? Comments? Okay, any comments from the public? Comments on the phone? No comments. I, I know I didn't ask for a motion to be made, but uh, motion, can we have a motion to take neutral? Okay, so any further comments because we didn't take the motion before. Okay, uh, roll call please. Dr. Bolat. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Um, aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Pines. Aye. Ms. Setton-Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Dr. Yip. Aye. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. The motion carries. Next one. Please. Okay, so AB 2682, Burke. This is and This bill will remove the physician supervision requirement for certified nurse midwives, and it would allow um, CNMs to attend cases of normal childbirth and to provide prenatal, interpartum, and postpartum care, including family planning care for the mother and immediate care for the newborn in a variety of settings, including home, home settings. This bill would require co-managed with refer to or transfer care to a physician and surgeon if the condition is beyond the CNM scope of practice based on education and preparation, and there is evidence that a condition or disease likely jeopardized the health or life of the newborn or mother, and the necessary resources and personnel are not available in the setting of care. It would require all consultation to be in the patient record and it would require all emergencies to be um, referred to a physician immediately. This bill removes physician supervision for CNMs. Although the board was supportive of the bill in 2013 that removed physician supervision for licensed midwives, it was because the bill was very restricted and clear on what types of patients licensed midwives could accept and for patients that did not meet the requirements and it would not allow, it didn't allow licensed midwives to accept high risk patients. This bill would essentially allow a CNM to accept all patients there are no clear limits on what types of patients a CNM could accept. So um, because we took an opposed and less limited position last, um, last year, and this bill is very similar, staff basically what we said is we're opposed unless there's clear limits on what types of patients um, a CNM could accept, similar to the licensed midwife bill. So that's what staff is suggesting, opposed and less amended. Hey, any comments? This is second time we're taking the position, so. Okay, can we have a motion to oppose unless amended? Okay, so any further comments from the board? Comments from the audience? No comment. Carrie Sparrow von Licensed Midwife. I'll be brief because I know everybody wants dinner. But I continue to have concerns. One, it's really hard to have two um, legislative standards for midwives practicing in the same setting. Nurse midwives don't come out of school with training to attend home birth. And I think that needs to be a component um, in this. And, and it makes sense that and those they, can, they can continue to care for at home be the same as what licensed midwives do for protecting the public. Um, if we don't do that, I can tell you what's going to happen is there's going to be lateral transfers from licensed midwives to CNMs to do the breaches, to do the twins. So keep an eye Got on it. Got it. Thank you. Any other comments uh, from the audience? Comments on the phone? No comment. Okay, so the motion is opposed unless amended. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Dr. Levine. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Pines. Aye. Ms. Sutton-Wills. Yes. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Dr. Yip. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. The motion carries. Next. 741 would set a five-day limit on all opioid prescriptions for acute pain management for minors. This bill would exempt from the five-day limit opioid prescriptions for management of pain associated with cancer, use in palliative or hospice care, and management of chronic pain not associated with cancer, and treatment of a substance use disorder. This bill would require prescribers to use the disorder and discuss potential risks associated with opioid use, and the specific discussion is specified on page two of the analysis. This bill would require prescribers to obtain written consent on a standardized consent form developed by the medical board for the prescription from the minor, minor's parent or guardian. The consent form must include specified information and not information. 
bill would require the prescriber to maintain the consent form in the minor's record. This bill would specify that the opioid limitation and the written consent requirements would not apply if the minor's treatment with opioid medication is associated with or incident to a medical emergency as documented in the minor, minor's medical record or in the prescriber's requirements would be detrimental to the minor's health or safety. The prescriber would be required to document in the minor's medical record the factor or factors that the prescriber believe constituted cause for not meeting these requirements. Providing education to parents on the risks of opioids will help to promote the board's mission of consumer protection. Although this bill exempts management of recurrent illnesses that aren't considered chronic but that are not acute. However, this bill does allow a physician to use their professional judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. In addition, if a minor is having a major surgical procedure, the five-day limit may not be appropriate. There may be a limit that is more reasonable than five days. Lastly, this bill would require the board to develop a consent form. However, this patient's medical record without requiring a consent form. So as such, board staff recommends that the board oppose this bill unless it is amended. If, if you don't agree with the oppose <coughs> unless amended, you could similarly take a support if amended or a neutral if amended. And, and the specific amendments we would be asking right. for. That's well, the, I mean, looking for it to be a longer limit than a five-day limit, I don't think we should actually, we should probably say reasonable because unless someone has like an exact day limit, I think probably what we've done in the past is just set a more reasonable limit. Um, I don't know if you agree with the points that I brought up, so I'm not a physician, so <laughs> I op open it up. But the, it's just, it may not be appropriate, like I said, something that doesn't fall into that, that's just not considered chronic and it's not considered acute, that this may kind of limit that. So I don't, I don't, I open it up for discussion. And the consent form, just as a staff, um, us developing a consent form, we don't really think it's, I to kind of told the author's office, we don't really think it's necessary. You could require the same information that's in the bill just to be included in the patient's medical record form that has to be included. I kind of relayed this, that as technical assistance to the author's office. Actually, there was um, the author's office, one of the staff person handling this bill was actually going to come today, but she got sick, so she couldn't come, so. Uh, Ms. Lawson and then Dr. Levin. Uh, my preference would be a support um, if amended position. I, I um, don't like about this bill is the standardized consent form or, or inviting the board um, itself into this process. I don't, I mean, if there's a more reasonable limit or if they, they can tinker with um, some of these, you know, um, conditions for which these things would be, I would be comfortable with that. But I don't like this consent form. Dr. Levine. Yeah, I think Jennifer and I had talked about this bill, and there are things like um, acute sickle cell crises and um, acute intermittent porphyria, um, conditions that are, that are associated with severe pain, and, and stipulate limiting, you know, limiting the, the limitations in the bill or the ex limited exemption, exceptions in the bill just don't feel right to me. Um, the, the, and, and again, five days, it's, a, it's kind of an arbitrary number problem, that, um, particularly for, for, major for major surgery or multiple trauma patients, for example. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I would, uh, I'm not sure about support if amended, but I, I, I could live with neutral and working with the author's office on trying to. I would like to hear from the physicians about um, an amendment that would include charting an exception to five days should an exception be made rather than a hard and fast exception to five days and with that supporting with amendment. So it says, um, it, I saw the discretion. Yeah, so if they believe in their professional judgment that the five limit day limit and they have to basically put in the patient's chart why they believe in their judgment that that five-day rule shouldn't apply. So there is, and I did tell the author's office I would bring that up so that, um, that, that it does basis, they have to know that in the chart, but they have to basically say why they didn't think the five-day um, limit was appropriate. So there is an exception for that. And so then what, with that, given that the exception is there, why, why the opposition to the five-day limit if, if in one's professional um, judgment I mean, it's up to you, that's why I, I actually brought that point out and told the author's <laughs> office I would bring that point out in my... Um, yeah, in my I'm just... At, but that's my okay. question. Uh, yeah, just to answer you, Brenda, is that... Of a doctor. We've, we've seen enough of these cases where two doctors differ. 
you got experts on uh, our side, defendant side. So standard of care is not that simple to say if their exception was actually standard of care or not. So it just makes me somewhat concerned because then somebody else might take a different stand compared to the physician who is doing that. Uh, I mean, each of the cases was such an opinion. That's why they just have such a tough time deciding which one is who is correct, and both are well qualified. So that does worry me. But uh, oppose is maybe a, bad, a tough word, but neutral is not a bad word either. So, uh, so uh, let me take the go this side, uh, Dr. Cross, and then Dr. Hawkins. It was a five-day five -day bill last year that failed that would have been across the board for all ages. What was the oh, reason I for that? I think that was being considered, or may have been print for a short amount. I wasn't in print. Okay, yeah, I know it was a wood bill that was being considered, I think, but I don't think that it was. this five days for minors just to an attempt just to take a minors. smaller bite of the apple? I think, bill itself to minors. I think they're trying to get at minors that are seen for certain like conditions or injuries, and they're given a large amount of opioids, and that's kind of how they get, um, you know, you kind of listen to the testimony hearings, that's how they get um, started and, and addicted to opioids. So I think that's the problem that this bill is trying to address. Has the Pediatric Association? The pediatric has basically said with with certain exceptions, there should be no use of opiates in anyone under the age of 18. Um, and and their, I mean, the real abuse is in the cough syrups with codeine, yep. with Vicodin, um, dentists giving, you know, 30 pills after, or 30 days of treatment after a root canal where kids take, you know, the, the pain level is, you know, worth a day or two of treatment. So the, benefit of, the, the benefit of a support, if amended, uh, and the amendment would just be to assure that a physician can put his or her reason. You can imagine, particularly in the treatment of a child, it may be the parent that's pressuring for a longer prescription, and the physician is put in a difficult bind. Um, and if the physician can simply say, the law limits us to five days, and I've got no reason to make an exception, Easier for the physician. So I would I would move to support if amended. Okay. Uh. Well, I may be misreading. I just we have a five day limit, but there's the physician can provide exceptions, and therefore they can do what they believe is medically indicated. So I wonder. Okay, uh, Kim. I just wanted to go to the five day. I think I know why the five day limit is because um, I was recently on a call with the national individuals at the national level talking about this and I guess I think it was a CDC that came out with it and they said that at six days um, that the children for like Arizona they just did, uh, did a five day limit. I think that was their governor did a bunch of bills and it, they put the five day limit in and that's where they were taking that from is that that's what they had said at, okay. at six days and actually I think this is for this is for everyone is what I think it came out with um, because I know the five-day limit for Arizona is not but that's, the, that's what they said they came out and then it, I think at 12 days they said it doubles again so I think that's where a lot of people are getting that five-day limit from from what I've heard anyway yeah I uh, Howard I know I heard your uh, uh, motion so I'm, I'll ask for a second in a minute uh, and there are a lot from the patients in chronic pain that they cannot be treated they're struggling so but this is for minors so that's totally different issue so that's why I, I I want to make sure that we we look at this bill purely for that limited thing rather than big globally significant backlash on, the, on both sides dr. Uh, dr. Bollard no, uh, thank you dr. Levine for bringing up a very important condition um, that is really painful to watch, uh, and that's children with a sickle cell pain crisis. And this, um, our black community. My, I guess one of the things that this, this makes me think about, and I'm very much on board and understand the AAP, and I think that they would definitely look, be thinking, we gotta treat these patients. But I also think that one of the things is we're moving away from opioids uh, in general, in adults. That's what we're hearing on this board, I would like at some point to be able to hear about the treatment of chronic pain in children because I, I do agree that we should not be prescribing opiates for a period of time for 
uh, as our neurosurgeons said just the other day, they said, we found out we were prescribing opioids longer than we knew. For this bill, I think I'm with uh, my colleagues here. I would support um, with I amendment. Okay. So before, we wait, before any we other go. comments before I ask I tell what the amendments are? <laughs> okay, Dr. Krause has a motion support if amended. So we do need to know amendments. We know that one. Just, just, I kind of heard a couple different things. So just to remind everyone that there's already a, a allowance for an exception. So that wouldn't be one of our amendments. So the consent form is, I think, what I've heard. Or is that if everyone's okay with the five day limit, then that wouldn't be an amendment. I just want to be clear because I'm going to have to write a letter. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's in the building. Yeah. Dr. Levine. Yeah, I, would, I would like to add sickle cell crisis to call that out specifically. That um, I'm not even sure what. Like as an exception? Yes, it says, I think, I think it says cancer. You've got cancer. Chronic pain not associated with cancer would, would include sickle cell, but. No, well, it's, there are acute episodes, though. Okay. Now, this is what happens when we try to legislate practice of medicine. But uh, uh, anything else you want to add on before we got a motion made? Have to give me this belly out of here. <laughs> I mean, there will be a ton of other uh, conditions, but that's this is the worrisome. But because it's for minors, I think our motion of uh, support, if amended, is probably appropriate. If it was for all the people, that would uh, scare me to death. Uh, because uh, okay, no other comments from board or any comments from the audience. Thank you, Megan. No questions on the phone? Good. So Make sure it's We would have to ask that you would stick with the opposed position. I think the points are there. Um, with the strongest being legislating the practice of medicine, which is what this bill does, um, I think that it's, it's important to note that it's predetermining the standard to be five days as appropriate. In one, the, one of the exceptions, that five days is the most that could ever be found appropriate. And if you, in your professional judgment, need to add a day or two or three um, that you must now defend yourselves because you are going against whatever the standard is that has just been set arbitrarily. Um, I think it's important children. it goes all the way up to a 17 and a half year old athlete in high school uh, that can experience you know a number of conditions they can have all sorts of severe injuries um, these are teenagers that are driving and may end up in some sort of car. I don't want them to be children in pain um, because they are not, you know, a 70 pound 12 year old or however they weigh. Um, but I think that there needs to be flexibility, and that is the problem with putting something so stringent in law. Uh, it also, I just wanted to point out, it sets a bad precedent signed parental consent form for a medical procedure for a minor. Um, it's something that we have not been uh, in favor of doing for quite some time, and I think that this starts down that road. Um, I think it's, you know, overall, there are a lot of problems with this. The AAP exact same provision in a similar bill. Um, I know I've discussed this with them, with their lobbyist, and uh, I thought that they were opposed, but they are not officially on record, so I can't say that they are to this. But I will say that they are to an, a very similar provision in a different bill. Um, and so we would just ask that you remain practicing medicine as this bill does. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Yes, sir. Come on. Just a reminder that your annual report says you have 137,967 licenses, and this means you only represent. 31% of your licensed doctors. Their point is to protect doctors. Your point is to protect patients. So just remember that when you consider the points of views from the CMA. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? No okay, so we have a motion to support if amended with, uh, with all the amendments given to Jennifer. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. 
Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Ms. Pines? Yes. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. The motion carries. Okay, AB 2760 would require a prescriber to co prescribe doses for the patient is 90 more morphine milligram equivalents for an opioid medication per day. If an opioid medication is prescribed concurrently with a prescription for benzodiazepine, or when the patient presents with an increased risk for overdose, including a patient history of overdose, a patient with a history of, of a substance use disorder, or a patient at risk for retention and longer tolerance. This bill would require the prescriber to provide education to pa patients receiving a prescription that would require a post co prescription for naloxone. Um, this bill would specify that any violation of the bill's requirements would constitute unprofessional conduct and be grounds for disciplinary action by the board. This bill will increase at risk patient consumer protection. In addition, it will not require these prescriptions to be filled if the pa patient cannot fill them for any reason. So, board staff is suggesting the board take a support position on this bill. And it, just in the past, we've historically kind of just supported widespread um, access to naloxone. So I got that part. So can you explain about uh, what's the something? So they have to do a co-prescription naloxone if they meet those requirements. So so that's that's so the only thing. Co-prescription for naloxone, and then um, an education to patients. Okay. And then if they don't comply, then it would be subject to disciplinary action. I'm thinking aloud. I mean, so naloxone uh, uh, is a competitive antagonist for, for opiates, heroin, and it can block that because it more potently binds the, the site. I just wonder, I understand they're going to be educated if there's going to be a risk appropriately. So it helps if you're using heroin to reverse it, but if you... I just have a concern about the education part of it. Yeah, I mean, I think in the past we've kind of supported bills that allow like pharmacies to get naloxone because there is there is really um, little to no um, harm of giving someone taking naloxone. It, 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 it overdose it basically reverses the overdose and it showed to save a lot of lives. Um, CDPH is working on getting naloxone out to um, the counties and we've kind of always supported increased access to naloxone. So. I got that. I was uh, like Dr. Hawkins answered. Well asked. What's the paper you got to give us just to make sure that they understand that uh, opioids are bad for you? I hope they do. <laughs> so. Well, and the, I have a question. I mean, this requires this co-prescription if a patient presents with an increased risk for overdose, including a patient that has a history of overdose or a patient that has a high prescribing opioids to people who have been repeatedly overdosing on them for one reason or another or who have a substance abuse disorder and then are we actually providing them education or are we just providing them a tool by which to reverse I mean w I, that I, I'm not sort of getting that if we're not providing them the right education just Naloxone. So the education requirement is just provide education to patients re receiving a prescription to whom this bill applies to and their households on overdose prevention and the use of naloxone. It's pretty broad. It's but, just but is it truly the standard of care to provide opiates to patients with history of overdose? It's about prescribing the opioids is about getting the co-prescription for naloxone. Uh, but that's, that's not really what this is saying. This is saying that you have to provide Okay. So it's not, not an addict whom you're prescribing opiates to. It's it's someone with 90 uh, morphine mill equivalents per pres uh, per day prescription, comma, someone at risk for overdose, someone who has a history of overdose. So these are so it's under any of these circumstances. Write a I think you have to prescribe naloxone. You have to write a prescription for naloxone. Yeah. That's how I read it. So, it's the, so if you're seeing a, uh, someone a heroin who addict. appears to be a heroin addict, you yeah. have to prescribe this drug. Yeah, and there's I'm no saying. requirement. That's what I'm, I'm yeah. trying to clarify what yeah. this is. Yeah. yeah. Well, then, Christina, I'm confused. Like, <coughs> you were given this prescription. <coughs> <coughs> 
That's, that's how I thought you explained it, but I think that it's the but the requirement is just a prescription of naloxone right. if the other. So it's not touching what you can prescribe opioids for. It's it's, it's not addressing it. It is it's a co-prescription. Co that's right. That's exactly right. right. Okay. Oh, uh, guys, guys, we're de degen. What are the time? Okay, so. Everybody exactly knows uh, what, what uh, uh, Jennifer, can you please explain again what? Okay, I'll tell you what the bill says and not what I'm paraphrasing. It says, notwithstanding any other law, a prescriber shall do the following. Prescribe naloxone hydrochloride for a patient when one or the more follow for the patient is or more morphine milligram equivalents of an opioid medication per day. An opioid medication is prescribed concurrently with a prescription for benzodiazepine. The patient presents with an increased risk for overdose, including a patient with a history of overdose, a patient with history of substance use disorder, or a patient at risk for returning to a high dose. So it's not really addressing high opioids. It's saying this is when you need to provide a co-prescription for naloxone. I mean, the intent of this bill is to provide wider access to naloxone. Um, and they're setting uh, yeah. some criteria when you have to do that prescription. So it's basically telling, even though it's, again, uh, what is some prescri prescriptive practice you like to prescribe naloxone when these conditions are met. Exactly. It's just setting that criteria for when you do the prescription. Okay. So we got, uh, you're asking for support or you want any amendments? Uh, I mean, I'm just in the past, we've just supported wider access to naloxone. So that's why I'm suggesting support. Uh, Ron is hungry. So you can see, uh, do we have a second? Unfortunately. Okay. Any further comments from the board? What's the, anyone know the cost of naloxone? Yeah, I do. Um, the the um, nasal spray, um, the, the uh, injectable form is um, 40, I think it's $40 for somewhere between 25 and $40 at CVS for, yeah, the most insurance covers it. Yeah, uh, and remember that we encourage the high schools one death from overdose, it's worth it. So, okay, any further comments from the board? Comments from the fair audience? Comments on the phone? No comment. Okay, motion is support. So, uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat. Aye. I have a small personal investment in a Naloxo manufacturer, and I must abstain. Ms. Lawson. Dr. Levine. Abstain. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Pines. Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills. Dr. Yip. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. The motion carries. Next one. Okay, the next one is AB 2789 Wood. This bill would require a healthcare practitioner authorized to issue a prescription to have the capability to an issue an e prescription and to transmit an e script prescription to a facility require a pharmacy, pharmacist, or other practitioner authorized to dispense and furnish a prescription to have the capability to receive an e prescription by January 1st, 2020. This bill would require all prescriptions to be issued as e prescriptions by January 1st, 2021. This bill does include some exceptions starting on page one of the analysis. Receipts of written oral or fax prescriptions shall not be required to verify that the prescription falls under one of the exceptions. They can continue to dispense medications from legally writ valid written, oral, or fax prescriptions. This bill would state that a violation constitutes unprofessional conduct and would be grounds for disciplinary action by the board. The board's primary mission is to remain a matter of concern for the board. Moving towards e-prescribing would help to eliminate fraudulent prescriptions, including prescriptions for opioids. However, it may be an issue for some physicians in California that do not have access to this kind of technology. In addition, there may be some prescriptions that are prescribed but only to be filled if needed. So I'm not suggesting a position on this one. Um, if you want it to be kind of neutral, I think it still has some work um, to, but those were kind of the two points from both sides, I, so I'll leave it. I think you're right. I mean, you go beyond uh, Napa Valley to the rest of California all the way to the border, you got a real problem in getting any e-prescription done. So they don't have e-prescription. They're taking penalties from Medicare uh, because of that lack of capabilities. And I don't even know if uh, all the retail pharmacies have that either in the small towns in the rural areas. So that's what my concern is. That's the only one. Uh, doctor, yeah. So I support prescriptions. 
Um, but certain drugs, and I may have misheard you, uh, most CTUs cannot be done by each script. I mean, that's my understanding, unless it changed recently. Did you say the that the C2s have to be prescribed by each script as well? There's exceptions, like if you have technological failures, if there's something like that. If um, We have to write all C2s on the uh, specialized blue form. Yeah, there's, there's not a, an exception for that. And actually, the whole purpose of this bill is to stop opioid fraudulent prescribing. So I think in there is this bill. So we're trying to get around the paper Mr. prescriptions. Dr. Cross. No, uh, uh, Jennifer assures me that uh, in the event of a solar flare and a global blackout that we can still use paper, so I'm okay with it. Uh, it will co be covered under one of the exceptions. I think Dr. Cross is hungry, too. Um, <laughs> Mr. Recent uh, hacking of critical systems, I'm not at all sure that uh, that uh, e, s e uh, prescriptions is going to help and might actually be a problem. Yeah, I, I am one that's in support of e-prescribing and, um, and I do, but I do recognize what Dr. Gananadev said. Um, just recently, our health system allowed us to e-prescribe, so we're a pretty big health system. So the point is, is that this go back and figure out what to do in some of these areas where, in fact, opioid uh, epidemic is highest. Mm -hmm. So based on a, you know, if you look at the maps, rural communities, small communities is where the problems lie. So we need to get the Googles and other people of the world to into cures. Okay, any, any other comments from the board? So uh, Jennifer, if we take support if amended, including uh, exceptions and uh, actually assisting rural area physicians, uh, that's one thing which came to my mind. I, I have no doubt e-prescriptions e are the way to go, but there are still a lot of places which are which will be very difficult to go by January 2019. That's what my concern is. Well, it's about 2020. They have to all prescriptions have to be issued by January 1st, 2021. So it's a little bit of a delayed implementation, but. So is the uh, state of California or somebody is going to help them to get there? I, I'm just asking because it's. I, mean, I know so can. many people who live in the small community. I mean, you don't even have to go that far away. These are small communities with tiny hospitals and just two or three physicians. They don't have capabilities. So that's so why it worries me that they might end up coming all the way down to a valley to my emergency room or, I mean, they actually you, your access to care is gone. It's, it's a real issue. Move to yeah, so you got the end of the whole part. Anything to, else uh, you can add? Uh, just tell me. rural areas or assist them? Right, yeah, and happens. assist them to, uh, to create a system. I, I, mean, I think the biggest problem is that uh, they don't have resources. Uh, it's, it's very difficult when you're pra practicing in a small town and barely making a living to have resources they don't want to do. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, so we have a motion may and seconded, support if amended. Uh, any further comments? Okay, any public comment? Comments on the phone? Everybody's got it. Angela, any comments on the phone? No comments. Thank you, Angela. It's tough to stay there. I mean, you're, you're alone there. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Ms. Lawson? Uh, yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton-Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? No. Okay, AB 2968 would update and modernize DCA's informational brochure for victims of psychotherapist patient sexual impropriety. Currently, the brochure is for victims of psychotherapist patient sexual conduct. This bill would update it, modernize it, change it to psychotherapist client sexual partners are outdated. 
definition of a psychotherapist. Um, board staff worked with other um, affected boards to provide technical assistance on the language included in this bill. This bill will update existing law and the content for the required information or brochure, which will help consumers know when to file a complaint. And board staff is suggesting that boards support this bill. I can explain in English a little more. I couldn't get what you were asking, so, okay, so can you explain what exactly? So in basically, the bill? it yeah. just updates the existing um, physical, uh, the, the psych, what is it? What's the name of the existing brochure? Uh, professional therapy never includes sex. So it's just updating it to okay. include behavior, which is not included like text or this brochure. Updating some definitions. We worked with the Board of Psychology on the language. This is actually a requirement of the Department of Consumer Affairs for this brochure, but the affected boards kind of work together to come up with this language, so we're hoping that the board can support this bill. Thank you. Any questions? Otherwise, can we have a motion to support? Any further comments from the board? Comments from the floor? Comments on the phone? No comments. Thank you. Roll call, please. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Ms. Lawson? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Pines? Yes. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. The motion carries. Next one. Okay. SB 944. This is the bill that I was talking about that also has to do with community paramedic pilot project that we were with. Um, in 1795, I kind of talked about some of the issues that we had. So. This basically is a little bit similar to 1795, which we supported. Um, we just took a support position on, but this actually allows for all of the concepts almost that in the pilot. So in 1795, it was just about purposes to include providing short-term post-discharge follow-up for per persons recently discharged from a hospital due to a serious health condition, providing directly observed case management services to frequent emergency medical services users, providing hospice services to treat patients in their homes, and has requirements. So it just basically says that EMS plans can include those services that I just read off as part of their EMS plan that IMSA has to approve. But it doesn't have as much criteria 1795 has in it. However, it does um, have some additional um, requirements that has made five positions are not as strong and opposed to this bill so it creates a community paramedicine oversight committee in IMSA and the community paramedicine oversight would be made up of like um, emergency physicians so they get to appoint a couple members um, it's made up of different members that are governor appointees and basically topics that I um, that I read off so <clears throat> It's a little bit broader than 1795. It allows for those services to be provided, but it kind of leaves it up to this committee and EMSA to come up with the guidelines to say what they're going to approve. Um, now, I think the thing that makes um, other organizations be based upon the formation and implementation of the pilot program. So they have to, the regulations have to use that pilot pro program standards as a basis, and that's giving, I think, some organizations more comfort because they are familiar with the pilot program and those guidelines. So just, I'm recommending a pose, but that's pure conflict with our position from 1995, but I feel like I have to bring up some of the concerns that we brought up back when the pilot project was going. So some of the concerns based on these additional things that allows community paramedicine to do is, um, we raise patient con safety concerns, and one of the concerns being that persons recently discharged care, the additional training not be su sufficient enough to teach paramedics a basis of disease management or how to diagnose and treat medical That's conditions. And we also were concerned that the pilot project did not specifically delineate what services will be allowed. This is kind of the same for this bill because it just lists, those, and that's all that it does. <coughs> uh. I mean, should we take these up tomorrow morning? Our meeting also said it would end at 6.30 tonight. I know. If the rest of the board is okay, we can take everything else tomorrow. What's your, your pleasure? I'm okay to continue. Mr. Warmont. Uh, actually, I have to agree. I think we're at the point now where we, the importance they deserve. 
So okay. uh, I would agree that it'd be good to adjourn now and. Okay, so Dr. Lewis. Tomorrow is not a lot. I mean, we can see. Oh, tomorrow's agenda. Look at to it and we will we get out it. <laughs> the problem is that there are folks here to right. speak on, on 1448 and that is could be a problem for them coming back tomorrow. Oh, so why don't we take up 1448 then? Mm -hmm. This one is that we just made a decision on a similar one that, that has similar provisions that I think we should make sure we reconcile and are consistent about and I I mean, I just have to be honest. I mean, I've been awake since 3 o'clock in the morning to get here, and I think other people have been too. And I'm losing my ability to just process information. I think that we represented that this meeting was going to end at 6.30, and there may have been people who already fell off the phone or members of the public who couldn't stay. Okay. Any other comments? So the, the, it's, it will take the bill what you're asking for us to take next. But to next one and talk about In my mind, this bill is somewhat different. It's not same. It's actually, it's expanding the Getting practice of the yeah, community. Yeah, and I've, I've had conversations so with kind of the totally, people that. Yeah, yeah this pose, is very, yeah. very worrisome having hospital discharges uh, to be seen by, discharges are seen by not just the primary care physician, even that specialist who took care of that patient. That is, if it is a surgeon, it's me. If it is a pulmonologist, it's uh, that person. So there is a lot more to it. That's why I was okay with the oppose. So unless you have a real trouble, then we can postpone it. So, yeah, I mean, I, like looking at the both bills, I understand our positions kind of conflict. The difference between this bill is the other bill kind of sets a lot of the criteria out, although they have to submit it part of their EMS plans, there's a set of criteria that they have to meet. This bill says what service is going to be provided, but it leaves all of the criteria and the regulations that have to be developed to accept EMS to develop regulations of the committee that's formed by this bill. But the committee is just an advisory committee. So IMSA has the power over establishing those minimum standards and regulations. So the minimum standards are not set forth in the bill anywhere. It says here's the services that can be provided, but it's leaving it up to the regulatory process. And basically what we're doing is, um, is just waiting for that regulatory process to set those standards. So nothing's in the bill. It's basically just like, here's the services you can provide. You have to submit it as part of your EMS plan, which is similar to AB 1795, but the difference is AB 1795 actually sets criteria that the EMS aid will, and this is totally kind of on IMSA setting those minimum standards, not putting them in the bill, but IMSA setting those minimum standards in regulation with advice from an advisory committee that this bill creates. So it is a little bit different. It's actually adding on like five different services that can be provided, but leaving it up to IMSA to set the minimum standard. The two bills is the 17 seriously for one issue, and that was transport. And it right. had two specific areas that we heard from right. that could be, the individuals could be transported to. This bill opens it up to a lot broader issues that these individuals can do than just that one transport to just those five we're recommending a post based on what the in the past we are. did bring up concerns with those serve those what that pilot project allowed which now this bill would set in uh, in my mind there is a serious consumer protection problem in this bill because I mean it's not a hospital discharge follow-up is not that simple I don't know with any amount of hours of training can follow a sick patient who was uh, discharged from a hospital, that really worries me. And this bill doesn't set forth what those post-discharge follow-up, what it consists of. It just says post-discharge follow-up for persons recently discharged due to a serious health condition. That's why it's just it's leaving that all up to the regulatory Dr. process. Dr. Cross. I've been following this issue with Jennifer and Kim for about four years now. Uh, and what we approved in terms of transport to sobering centers and mental health centers is far different from this. Right. Uh, and I, I would say that service to the community and to consumers. This I'm more leery of um, because it leaves medical decisions up to paramedicine experts who have yet to have their exact training and supervision to be defined. And it's when I saw ambulance companies 
get on board the paramedicine program to increase your bottom line. So I'm concerned that some of this may be profit driven by private ambulance companies who wish to hire more paramedics to provide services that may not be the best some time, but this is really not fully cooked yet. Uh, and I think we have to oppose it until we have uh, more evidence that this is safe for consumers. We could also take an opposed less amended position like we did on 1795 too and, and ask them for criteria, but. Uh, can we have a motion? Let's discuss it. have a second. Okay. okay, any further discussion? Any comments from the audience? Comments on the phone? Any no comment. comment. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Dr. Bola? Aye. Dr. Yes. Ms. Lawson? Abstain. Dr. Levine? Yes. Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Yes. Ms. Sutton Wills? Abstain. Mr. Warmoth? The motion carries. We That's jump all death. the way to. That kind of death. Yes. I just like to make a comment. I, I think that although I respect Slauson's comment, I think we're kidding ourselves if we're going to jump to, and also what uh, Carrie said, we're going to jump to. I understand about folks being here who are prepared to talk and come before us, but this is not a slam dunk five-minute discussion either, in my opinion. No, Dr. Hawkins, I totally understand. I think the reason I'm considering like Mr. Park here, it's not easy to stay in a hotel here. So I think we should uh, take this, this, whatever length of time it takes, and then take the rest tomorrow. So, but I'm, it's your board. I'm just managing it. So <laughs> you tell me what know what they already know. I, I think if there's even one person here who came here specifically for this issue and wants it discussed now, then we should do that. So I don't mind if you if you canvass uh, the group to see if there is. Let's jump to 1448. Okay, SB 1448. This bill would require on and after July 1st, 2019, physicians and surgeons, osteopathic physicians and surgeons, podiatrists, acupuncturists, for the first time as specified. The physician on probation must provide the patient or the patient's guardian or healthcare surrogate with a separate disclosure that includes a licensee's probationary status, the length of the probation and the end date, all practice restrictions placed on the licensee by the board can find further information on the licensee's profile page on the board's online license information website. This bill would specify that a licensee required to provide a disclosure shall obtain from the patient or the patient's guardian or healthcare surrogate a separate signed copy of the disclosure. This bill would not be able to comprehend the disclosure and sign a copy of the disclosure and a guardian or healthcare surrogate is unavailable to comprehend the, com comprehend the disclosure and sign the copy. If the visit occurs in an emergency room or an urgent care facility, or the visit is unscheduled, including consultations at inpatient facilities, or if the licensee who will be treating the patient during the visit, or if the licensee has a treatment relationship with the patient. So those are the exceptions to the notification requirement. This bill would require the board on and after July 1st, 2019, to provide the following information for licensees on probation and licensees practicing under probationary license, licenses in plain the probation post the causes alleged in the operative accusation, along with a designation identifying those causes by which the licensee has expressly admitted guilt and a statement that acceptance of the settlement is not an admission of guilt. For probation imposed by an adjudicated decision of the board, the cause for probation stated in the final the causes by the length of the probation and end date and all practice restrictions placed on the license by the board. The probationary status of a physician is public information and available on the board's website. Ensuring that patients are informed promotes the board's mission of consumer protection. The language in this bill is very similar to only require patients to 
cases, and this bill would require probation notification for all physicians on probation. I'm not suggesting a position. <laughs> I thought you were, Jennifer, so Dr. Cross. in protecting consumers. Part of consumer protection is maintaining the function of the board to adequately investigate all complaints and uh, work with the AG's office to create uh, conditions of probation. With mandatory notification, we may be drowned with cases of physicians who will not accept probation. Uh, and we may not have the adequate staff, resources, funding, and space to conduct lengthy hearings. Uh, and this bill has some means of assuring that the board won't be broken by this, such as providing funding for more staff, space, time, personnel, uh, then I would be reluctant to endorse this. I'm also somewhat concerned as naturopaths and acupuncturists covered, but not optometrists and psychologists. So if we think that there's some great merit in this, and there may be, I think it should apply to all of the healing arts, and I think that the bill and the law appropriate functions of all court, uh, and it will need more funding. Thank you, Dr. Cross. Any other comments? Just, just my comments here are that we spent a lot of time last year, and we came up with a resolution, and it went in separate, and then that was with the board support. By the way, that's the, right now we have a position on probation notification, which this board took, which was in the last year's bill. My suggestion is stick with it. What we support before. So that's what we thought about this at length. So that's what we think it might be, unless the board has option, whatever we want to do, oppose it, support it, support if amended. But this, we already have a position on this. So that's what I thought might be the right thing to do. I'll take any other opinion you got. Uh, Dr. I, I would agree with the comment about its application to all the healing arts boards. Um, any bill that passes around probation notification ought to be applied to all, and, and it isn't just about you know what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's really about if this is important, all kinds of practitioners should have the same degree of protection. And I would agree with, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Ganadev, that the, the decision, that the, the hard won decision, or the hard work we did to come to a decision last year. Um, represented a position the board felt comfortable. Any comments? So it looks like, uh, Jennifer, the, if we take that motion, uh, I'm not, I don't think we added last year that it should, applies to, uh, it should apply to all healing arts boards. Is that correct? That's correct. We support that will be another amendment mm -hmm. uh, uh, beyond what we did last year. Any other comments from the board? I, I th Dr. Dr. Bola. Yes, I think the, your issue is, a, is an important one be, about making sure that this is funded because we already have things adding more isn't going to get us there. Um, but I, um, so I do support the comments of my fellow board members. Kim. So I do just want to point out about the funding because I don't want anyone to have a, a wrong conception about what happens through the process. So what else is on it? And so we had the last one. I think the actually I think the um, analysis that's in the bill right now was actually from our our version of last year. I don't think it has the full one in here um, because we need the additional. Um, so it's it's from the full one of all physicians that we went back to an analysis previous. Last year, but let's say. That if you guys move support if amended and it's going to be um, just with the cases so the cases were um, sexual misconduct drugs and alcohol during pra uh, practice um, criminal conviction, criminal conviction and then it. everybody that yeah. has um, prior discipline and, and those kind of things we do physical analysis on just that and 
and we would move that forward through the legislative process um, asking for more positions and more funding to be put into our fund. Now, I'm not saying that that might n need to be a fee increase later on because we're increasing our budget, but that's how it happens. So we'll do it. We'll get those for the funding to be added in order to move forward with it. So just so everybody understands how that process works. Hey, any other comments? So anybody would anybody likes to make a motion? I'll move to support this amendment. Uh, the microphone and take on I'll move to second. Let me take the second and then we'll invite commenters. Okay. So, any comments from the board before I go to comments from the audience? What are the amendments? Have we already stated those? Yes, we just did. So, Probation, if they were on probation for those cases. And then also to include all healing right, arts. Right, and then also to include all healing arts, which is part of And then get, get a budget estimate. I mean, that's not enough, but that's for that's the staff. That's part of the process, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if no other. Okay. Julie, thanks for coming. <laughs> I thought you said you were retiring. <laughs> I actually have law at the University of San Diego School of Law, and I am cognitively challenged. Uh, CPIL supports SB 1448, as just as we supported all of its predecessors, uh, which would require affirmative disclosure of probation status by a number of different health care Only if a patient is aware that you exist, many people aren't, and aware of your regulatory role in licensing and disciplining physicians. It's useful if only if the patient is aware that you post information about doctors on your website. And is able to access the information. And it's uh, and also the patient has to be willing and able to parse through sometimes a 50-page disciplinary decision filled with legal jargon and uh, findings of fact and conclusions of app that you're rolling out um, that would uh, send patients an alert uh, if, uh, to physicians that they subscribe to uh, if they if they subscribe to it. But that assumes that they have one of these. And not everybody describes the target audience as every patient in California. Target groups are seniors, ethnic groups, parents, legislators, California consumers, and licensees. There's lots of folks in lots of those categories that don't have one of these things or don't know how to use it. Um, right now, the uh, priority, in fact, your paramount priority is public protection, and this bill ensures consumer information and consumer choice. So we support the, the bill, and we urge you to do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, next one is uh, Mr. Yeah, we're taking this on because I would have left two hours ago if we weren't going to do this one. And thank you to Julie for saying all that. Now you don't have to hear any of this. It is in the best interest of public safety for doctors to report to their patients when they're on probation, especially considering you're going so easy. Well, Tammy's wasn't closed, but you, you bartered down what should have been a probation to a slap on the wrist public letter of reprimand over the death of their son. I am aggrieved that the public is overlooked on a far too regular basis protecting of disciplines coming out of this board is indicative of it being run by doctors protecting other doctors and public members who acquiesce to them. No board should be composed of the very people that it's meant to protect the public from. It's ludicrous. This is 100% your job to support. It's not your job to listen to the CMA who protects doctors. It is your job to support protecting patients, and that's what this bill does. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.
Hello, my name is Marianne Hollingsworth, and I would like to encourage you all to vote to endorse SB 1448. Most people with whom had advanced degrees and no one knew that they could look up their doctor on the medical board website. These were all very educated people. It is unconscionable that a patient cannot be warned if her or his doctor has been found responsible, especially for sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. It is prominent. Not going to risk the patient's all own informed consent invalid in these cases. It is, and it is also ridiculous that everyone in the doctor's office knows except the patient. The hospital knows, the insurance company knows, the office staff knows, and of course the chaperone knows, and only the patient is left this afternoon. You is a new discipline of a doctor in Santa Ana who was given eight years probation for lewd conduct in public. He cannot treat minors, he cannot treat any females. So he can only treat men. So would you men on the board want to know if the The recent case of Larry Nasser shows what can happen when people keep quiet about a doctor who sexually abuses his patients. Lives can be altered forever. In the spirit of the Me Too and Time's Up movements, I encourage this board to think of the patients you are bound by law to give patients choice and who they will trust with their own medical care. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hollisworth. Uh, any other audience comments? Comments on the phone? Any comments on the phone? No comments. Hi. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Dr. Levine. Yes. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Pines. Yes. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. The motion carries. Jennifer, thank you. And uh, we will adjourn till tomorrow morning.